Uh, yeah, welcome everybody to the Python workshop. Let me share my screen. Oh, sorry. Uh, first, I'm going to mute everyone. Uh, mute all. So that will help cut out the background noise. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can also use the chat. <coughs> Okay, that was most definitely the wrong button. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so yeah, um, let's see, is it working now? Yeah, okay. So welcome everybody to the Python workshop. Um, we'll be going through um, several introduction introductory techniques for uh, using Python. Um, we have uh, pandas, which is uh, a package for reading data, and we're going to look at uh, plotting and do some data analysis. And if there's time at the end, uh, I'll show you also some uh, uh, more advanced uh, Python techniques. Uh, so my name is uh, Jarno Vanderkolk. Uh, I'm the Senior Scientific Computing Specialist at the University of Ottawa. And that means it's my job to help researchers with all their computational needs. So that can be high performance computing, uh, using the clusters of Compute Canada, for instance, uh, or teaching workshop and seminars like this, uh, but also anything that you need for, uh, for your computational needs for doing research. Um, that's what I'm here for. Uh, I also have uh, three helpers today. So Perfasha, Fabrizio and Will. Uh, they will be helping in the background in the chat. And so while I'm presenting, they will be able to monitor the chat for questions because it's very hard for me to see the chat uh, while I'm presenting like this. So, so uh, most of you already have uh, the slides because the link I sent, uh, it had the slides in them as well, but you can download them from uh, yarno.ca slash python.pdf as well. Uh, it's nice to have the slides on your own computer because then you can look at the slides um, while I go to other places. Because when I start programming, uh, I'll be switching back and forth between the environment and uh, um, and other screens. <laughs> so we'll get to this at the end of this uh, slides. But the main thing that we'll, that we'll be using is a, a website called uh, ccg.ca. And a few of you have contacted me without uh, the UOttawa credentials, so I set them up on the backup server. So everybody should have access to this. And if you not, don't, uh, let us know in the chat and uh, the helpers will help you get started with that. So this is roughly the program. Uh, I can't guarantee I'll <laughs> stick to it because it depends on how long the exercise is taken, that sort of thing. Uh, but first I'll do a, a quick introduction about Python, uh, what it is and how to use it. And then I'll have a section about reading data and then how to plot the data. And then we'll have a lunch break from 12 to one. And then we get started again uh, with doing uh, data manipulation. And if there's time, we'll get into the basic scripting with if then and for loops. So uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, it has a chat function. So if you move your mouse a little bit around the screen, uh, you'll see that bar pop up and it will have a button that says uh, show conversation. So you can click that and it will open the, the chat to the side and then you can, uh, you can chat. <laughs> so yeah, just try that out now and uh, just say hello and introduce yourself and yeah, uh, what you hope to gain from this uh, seminar. Yeah, I see people are being shy. Oh, there we go. Hello. <laughs> hmm. 
yeah, we've got a lot of people in the chat. That's good. <laughs> okay, so that seems to be working for most people. And not surprisingly, here most people are here to learn Python, of course. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Uh, so I like said um, we have some helpers here. Uh, so if uh, Will Kokcici, <laughs> uh, I should not try to pronounce them, <laughs> uh, Perfasha and Fabrizio, and uh, yeah, like I said, they'll be here to help you in the chat. So whenever you have trouble with exercises or get stuck for somewhere, you can type in the chat and they'll help you out. So here's a question. Um, what do you think uh, data science is? And you can type your answers in the chat here. So that's like, um, yeah. <laughs> what do you think is involved with doing data science? Like, what's the field? <laughs> okay, I see the science of data. Yeah, I mean, that's undoubtedly true. <laughs> Uh, studying how to work with data, analyzing visualizing data, analysis of data for prediction. <laughs> data science is cool, sure. <laughs> uh, stats, computing, algorithms, etc. How to understand data and interpret it. Uh, the science of collecting, understanding, and predicting data. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, pretty much it. So it's like the exciting discipline that allows you to turn raw data into understanding, insight, and knowledge. So it's really what most of the people said in the chat. Oh, obtaining data from, uh, obtaining knowledge from the data. Yeah, exactly. So normally when you have science, you have an hypothesis and then you do an experiment and experiments gives you data. And then from that data, you come to a conclusion. Uh, for data science, you start with the data and then you tidy up the data. Uh, which you need to do because you can't actually trust any data set that you get. Um, I'll get a bit back to that. I'll get back to that a bit later. And then you have the loop of visualizing, transforming and modeling the data. And you keep doing that until you reach a conclusion. And you can uh, put that into one encompassing program. So that's what we'll be doing today. So we're going to have a program that will import the data um, we won't do the tidying because I will give you a data set that's already tidy, but I'll still talk about it a bit. And then we have the loop of visualize, modeling, transforming, and visualizing. And finally, we get to the conclusion. And the nice thing is that you can totally encapsulate this in a program. And it also means that it's reproducible. So you can send your data set and your program to somebody else, and they will be able to reproduce your entire uh, your entire strategy for getting to that conclusion. So that will get you reproducible science. And I will be using, or actually we will be using Jupyter Notebooks for that. So a Jupyter Notebook is kind of like a mix between a program and a report. So you can write your text like you normally would in an article or email or communication or whatever, but you can insert code in your report and execute that code. So it's like an interactive report or you can just run the whole thing in one go and it will exactly reproduce all the steps that you did. So that's a very powerful way of doing uh, reproducible science. And then Python. So Python is a very high level programming language. Uh, it's also very general purpose. You can do anything with it that you want. Uh, it's an interpreted language. And what that means is that you can type a command, it will execute it. You can type another command and you'll execute it. Uh, this is different from programs that you write in C or Fortran or whatever, where you have to compile the code and it just runs in one go. Uh, also, one nice thing about Python is that it has a huge ecosystem. And with that, I mean you have lots of packages that you can download to extend the functionality of Python. So you have packages for reading data, but you also have packages for machine learning or um, basically anything. <laughs> So the language is um, sort of like this. Uh, you have uh, values, objects, and functions. And the way you can recognize them is uh, values are uh, numbers like <coughs> minus one or plus one, or a fractional number, so 1.3, uh, 
or you can have what's called a string value. So that's a type of, type of text, and it has to be encapsulated in these quotes here. So whenever you see quotes around something, uh, it means it's a string, and it represents text. So these are just values, uh, but to work with them, you want to store them in something. So you store them in objects, uh, also called variables. Uh, I'll use the terms interchangeably because uh, it's hard to keep track of it. <laughs> so that's something like n. And when you say n equals minus 1, then the value minus 1 is assigned to the object or variable n. And so then whenever you use n in your program, uh, it will represent minus 1. <coughs> And you can do the same with any other letter, so x equals 1.3, or you can have city name equals Ottawa. <coughs> and you notice that this looks like text, but it does not have the quotation marks. So that means that this is an object that's assigned the value uh, Ottawa. Uh, and then you also have functions. So functions let you perform operations on the data. So one function that's being that's used heavily in Python is the, the print function. Uh, print lets you print out uh, values. Oh, sorry, up. print lets you print out the, the values of objects. So here when I say print n, it will take the object n, which has a value minus 1. So it will print minus 1 to, uh, to the command line or to the Jupyter notebook. And another function is len, for instance, that gives you the length of a string. So when I do len city name, I will get the length of Ottawa here. So I will get uh, six as the output for this function here. So you can recognize the function with the square brackets. So you have another name without any quotation marks, but if you have uh, these round brackets, that means it's a function. And here I have uh, functions with uh, one argument. Uh, it doesn't have to be there, uh, you can also leave it out, but you still need to have the, the round uh, brackets. And then there are some special values. So there are lists, and you can recognize those with the square brackets. So when you have a square bracket, and then something, comma, something, comma, something, comma, something, that's like a collection of values, and it's called a list. It doesn't have to be numbers, uh, it can also be strings like this. And then we also have something called dictionaries. We won't be getting into those too much. I think I only used them once, maybe. But uh, just for completeness sake, uh, we should, I should talk about them. So that's, well, it's a dictionary. So you have a, a, a string that you want to look up. So for instance, here you have a string num, and it's 12. And here you have a string name, and it has the value something. So if you have a dictionary, you can ask for the entry num of that uh, object or dictionary, and it will return 12. Or you can ask for the name in a dictionary, and it will return something. So it's a nice way to uh, collect data into one object, and then you can use it uh, like that. So here's a, a warm-up quiz. Uh, so which one of these entries are numbers? So which one of these is a value that corresponds to a number? And you can type your answers in the chat. <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> so everybody says uh, the one on the left, which is the, the one ear. Uh, yeah, that's correct. So that's uh, the number. Uh, this looks like a number, but it's not because it has the quotation marks around this. So this is actually a string. Uh, this is one with the quotation marks, so that's a string as well. This is one without the quotation marks, so that means that this is an object, uh, but still not a number. So which one of these will uh, work? So we have the function log, which takes a logarithm of a number. So we have four uh, entries. And we assume that uh, the object one has been set to one. So which one of these will work? Uh, 
Yeah, looked like everybody got it. <laughs> so uh, everybody saw that uh, log of uh, one, uh, this will work. Yeah, because uh, one is a number, so the logarithm can take a number. Here you try to like the logarithm of a piece of text, and that doesn't work. And the same for this one. Uh, this one also works because one, the object one has been assigned a value one. So this is log of one. So this will return zero, and that one will return zero. Um, let's see, you have a question about dictionary, do we create it? Uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you can create it yourself, uh, but in this course, we will only see it once, and I'll explain it more uh, then. So, uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, the speed of Python. Uh, Python is a very good uh, language, it's very easy to use, uh, you type in what you want, and it looks a lot like uh, like a human writing. <laughs> uh, but the speed of it is not the greatest. And to show that, I'm going to do a, a numer numerical integration of the function x squared plus x times y plus y squared. And I'm going to integrate it from minus 10 to 10 with steps of 0 0.001. And what that means is I uh, take the integral and I look at grid cells of 0 0.001 by 0 0.001. I look at what the value is of the function f at that location, and I add it all up. So that's how you do an numerical integration uh, in code. Um, it's not too important, but the point is that this is a lot of work. Because if you go from minus 10 to 10, that's 20. Uh, that's a range of 20. And then with steps of 1,000, that means it's 20,000 steps in the x direction and 20,000 20, steps in the y direction, so that's 400 million steps. Uh, that's not something you want to do by hand, of course. So when I do that in Python, um, I do the speed test and I see that my time is 1 minute and 44 seconds uh, to calculate it integral. So that's pretty good, that's like 40 million operations in uh, less than two minutes. Uh, but if I do the same in C, which is a compiled language, which is uh, known for its speed, it takes uh, one second. So that's a factor of 96 difference. So Python for like raw computations is almost a factor of 100 slower than uh, when you write the same code in C. And that's because C is a, a, what's called a compiled language. So you translate the code into machine language and then it can run a lot faster. So yeah, that kind of sucks. Uh, but uh, the power of Python is in its ecosystem. And there are thousands and thousands of packages available. And the nice thing about the packages is that you can load them in Python, but the packages themselves, they don't have to be written in Python. They can be written in C. So any functions you call from the packages are likely going to be very fast. So you can see as, uh, Python as a, a sort of glue uh, to connect them all together. And you just take the packages that you want and you glue them together. You say, oh, I want the output of this packages and I put them into that package and I just write, write my whole pipeline like that. Uh, the Python packages, you can see them at uh, pypy.org. And when I checked last month, there were 233,536 projects on there. So just to give you an idea of how many packages there, there are available for Python. So it's highly likely if that you want to do something that somebody already wrote something for it. <laughs> so if you want to do something, I would highly recommend looking at PyPy first to see if you can get a package that already does what you want. So installing the Python packages are in your computer. Uh, there are different ways of doing it. Uh, the most common ones are Conda or pip. Uh, these are Python uh, development environments. So Conda, it lets you download Python uh, and also the packages. Uh, pip is part of Python and it also lets you download packages. Um, we won't be covering the installation here because it depends on the operating system, it depends on your computer, it depends on so many things uh, that it's really hard to get everybody on the same page with Python. <laughs> uh, oh, I see you said that there's already 242,000 projects right now. So in the month since I last checked, 
10,000 extra projects happen. That's impressive. <laughs> um, but the Python, uh, the environment that we'll be using, uh, which is called uh, Jupyter Notebooks, um, uh, on a server that we run, uh, it already has all the common packages installed, so we don't have to worry about installation uh, whatsoever. Um, this is also the syntax for using those packages, and it works with import. So you type import, then the name of the package, and then you can use it. So if I have the package math, which contains all the mathematical functions like sines and cosines and tangents and all that, then uh, you can call the function. So here you have the package dot sin and then the value. So here we're calculating the sine of three and we print the output using print. And I guess I didn't tell you this yet. Uh, yeah, they are in radians. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this print will print the text sign free equals, and then it will print the output of math sign. So um, you can now open your browsers, and you can go to uottawa.ccg.ca, or you can also go to ccg.ca and click on the launch button and choose uottawa. And we're going to open uh, chapter uh, one um, in that notebook. So I'll do that with you. I'll go to my browser. <coughs> so this is the, the ccg.ca website. And when I click on launch, launch <laughs> I can select uh, uOttawa. And I come to the sign-in page for uOttawa. This is a little home here thing as the text login. So I click that. And now I can log in with my UARWA credentials. Oh. Passwords are hard. There we go. Uh, you will not get this screen, most of you maybe, because uh, I have MFA enabled, which means I have two-factor authentication, which I highly recommend enabling, by the way. <laughs> so yeah, then we get into the Jupyter screen. And you will have a, a folder in there if you follow the instructions uh, called Python Workshop 2020 May Deploy. So I can click on that. And then I get all the files we need for the workshop. So I hope that works for most people. <laughs> and then I can open chapter one. I can just click on it. And now I'm in the notebook. Uh, so this is chapter one, getting started and we'll get familiar with how to use uh, the Python notebooks. So I'll just start right away with uh, an exercise to get you acquainted with this. Uh, so exercise one is to do some uh, simple arithmetic. So we can calculate uh, one plus one. So this is called a cell and you can type in uh, your Python code in here. So one plus one. And then to execute this, I have to do shift enter. So I have to keep shift pressed and then enter. And it will show me the output of one plus one, which equals two, which is correct, of course. And I can select it again, two plus two, like that. And if you want more cells, you can use the plus button uh, at the top here. And if you click that, it just adds more cells. So I'll let you play with this for uh, five minutes and let's also make sure that everybody is going to be on the same page. And yeah, make sure you shift enter instead of enter because if you just use enter, it does that, which isn't very helpful. <laughs> well, it's helpful when you try to code, but not when executing it. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, there's also the other operators like this minus, divide by, uh, times, and this is to the power of. So you can have two to the power of four, which is 16. 
So yeah, I'll give you uh, five minutes to uh, play with this a bit. So that's 9.33. So I see a question about uh, how to delete a cell. Uh, you can right click it, oh sorry, you can select it like that. And then there's a scissor icon at the top that removes it. Uh, how many decimal Python computes? Can we ask to show the result only for a specific number? Um, yeah, that's possible with the print statement, uh, with the format statement. Um, you can format the output. Um, then you can specify how many uh, decimals you need. Uh, I won't get into that, but uh, at the end, I'll show you the resources that you'll need for getting that. Is it only double precision, double precision arithmetic? Yeah, I think so. Uh, how do I change the working directory in Jupyter Notebook? Oh, it should just work for you, but uh, I'll get to that later because it looks like you're running ahead there. <laughs> Uh, does CCG automatically save at regular intervals? Um, yeah, I mean, the notebooks are always uh, running and they do get saved. Uh, you can always force, force to save yourself with the little save icon. And even if you lose your connection, the notebook keeps running. So you can just log in back and it's still there doing whatever it was doing when you left off. Okay, so I hope everybody's uh, a little familiar now with how uh, to execute commands in uh, the Python in the Jupyter notebook, and that you can make the most complicated things. You can all uh, smash it together and uh, just keep going like that. Um, so now we have had uh, the basic arithmetic. Uh, but suppose you want to calculate the, the sign, which is what I already had in the slides. And like the normal thing to try is like if you try sign or free, uh, but that doesn't work because uh, sign is a function that is in the math library, sorry, in the math package. And to load, to use that, you need to load it first. And you can do that with import math. So if I type import math, and I do shift enter, yeah, you'll notice it doesn't produce any output and no output is good because Python will most of the times not tell you anything unless something went wrong. So now we've loaded uh, the math function. So if you now try a sign of free, uh, it still doesn't work because it says sign is not defined. And that's correct because sign is part of the math package. So to actually use it, we have to uh, type math dot sign uh, free. And now we get uh, the sign of uh, free, which happens to be 0 0.14 and a whole bunch of other numbers. Um, and then also a neat feature about uh, Jupyter Notebook is that you can use auto completion. So if you have your library uh, or package math, and you do period, and then you press the tab key on your keyboard. It will show you all the functions that are available in that package. So you can see we have the arc sine, arc, arc sine, uh, the arc sine hyperbolicus, I think it's called. I'm not actually sure what it's called, but <laughs> it's the one with uh, the e powers instead of the complex e powers. And of course, degrees, that's just for converting between radians and uh, degrees. 
and there's a whole bunch of other uh, math functions as well including pi which is always a good one to have <laughs> and then execute uh, and then you can see that's pi so <clears throat> uh, if you want to know more about a specific function because we just had the name uh, we can do help math.sign and then it will give you help on the sign function so it says here sign it takes an argument x and it returns the sign of x and measured in radians you can also look at the cnh the hyperbolic sign and you can also get help about uh, the package itself and you can see this is the math module and here are all the functions that it contains uh, with the description of it so help is uh, really really powerful uh, because if you don't know how to use a certain function you type help name of the function and it'll tell you everything it knows about that function so you don't even need to google it <laughs> so then we get to uh, the jupyter part so jupyter like i mentioned in the beginning it's part code but it's also part report so you can put in text uh, and write the report and you can also mark up the text so the but it's called uh, so the formatting is called a markdown so if you look up here you have code that you can change into markdown and that changes the currently selected cell to either be interpreted as code or as markdown uh, we won't be using the other ones uh, all you need is code and markdown so this cell here that I've selected now, that's a markdown cell as you can see. And if I select this one, that's a code cell because it's running as code. So text, um, you can use formatting. So if you write something, want to write something in italic, uh, you can put it between uh, these asterisks, these little stars. Uh, if you want to make it bold, you use two of them. If you want to make it bold and italic, you use three of them. Uh, you can also write headers like this level one, level two, level three. You can see it becomes big, which is the uppermost header, then subheader and a subheader and a sub sub header, sub 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 sub, sub etc. And that's just that's done by using uh, the pound or the hashtag, as most people call it these days, and the hashtag symbol. And the more you use, uh, the higher the level. So here we have a level three, so it's free of these hashtags. And you can have much, much more formatting than that. Uh, I've put in a link in here that tells you all the markdown that you can use in uh, the Jupyter notebooks. So if I go there, we can insert links. We can make links with formatting can make references more links here's the basic formatting with the star triple star double star and a triple star you can also strike through text if you want write quotes and there's a whole bunch of stuff you can even write uh, tables in there these are the headers you can make the, the lines to separate them so yeah there is a lot of formatting you can do uh, with markdown So now it's your turn again. Um, so I have had have here uh, a cell in your notebook. And currently you can see it's code. So you have to change that to markdown. And you can type your uh, text in here. And then with shift enter you can uh, to display it. So I'll give you uh, f well, three minutes to do that. You can write any text you want. Uh, so I'll get back at uh, 9.43. Uh, tab only seems to displace text. Yeah, you have to type something that in period and only then does tab work. I uh, see James also says that you can use uh, LaTeX commands <coughs> uh, to make formulas in the markdown cells. Uh, yeah, that's true. If you use the 
dollar signs and then your later code and then dollar signs um, it will work i guess i can make an example here oh <laughs> markdown there we go oh sorry one thing i forgot to say that uh, if you have markdown text and you want to edit again, you can double click on it. And then you can change it. So yeah, for LaTeX, you can use the, the dollar cents and put your LaTeX inside of it, if you know LaTeX. Uh, how do you change the markdown? Uh, it's in the top here. You can choose between code and markdown. Okay, so I'll execute this with shift enter and then I find markdown. You'll notice that the entire Jupyter Notebooks uh, for these class are written in Markdown. So this sample that I had before, you can also double click it and you can see all the code I used to uh, create this. Okay, so now we sort of know how to use the, the Jupyter Notebooks. Like we can make our own text and we can execute code in the Jupyter Notebooks. So now we'll get to uh, the reading of the data. And reading of data, uh, it's best done in a package called uh, Pandas. Uh, it's very versatile and it lets you manipulate data in uh, very nice ways. And it's much easier than the, the functions that come with Python by default. So we'll using the Pandas package. So that means we'll have to import it. And like I said before, to import the package, you import it and then the name of the package. Uh, but I think pandas is a pretty long name. I don't want to try type pandas dot function the whole time. So instead I use import pandas as pd. So then it will import pandas, but then it will rename it as pd. So now I only have to write pd instead of pandas. I will also import uh, numpy. Uh, numpy is a function, is a package for uh, dealing with uh, numbers in a really nice way. Uh, it, it all happens in the background, so I will rarely use it directly, uh, but it will pop up from time to time. And then finally, there is a package called uh, I'm done. Um, sorry, a package called done, and that's a Python package I wrote specifically for this, um, for this workshop. Uh, it will let me see how people are doing with exercises and when they're sort of done with them, uh, when they're done with them. So I have a package done that I wrote and I'm importing the functions I'm done and quiz answer. Uh, you don't need to worry about that too much. Um, just make sure to execute uh, this code before you do anything else, because otherwise uh, the functions that I call from the packages won't work. So I'll select the cell, I'll press shift enter. I will get no output, which means that it worked. All you can see is that this number changed from nothing to a certain number. Uh, this is what I just said. Okay, so now we can uh, read uh, the CSV file. So if you go back to um, the file manager, I guess you can call it, uh, you can see you had the chapter one, which is what we're currently working in, but we also have a directory called uh, data, and that contains the data files. So I have two data sets that I'll be using for this uh, workshop. We have MPG, which stands for miles per gallon, which is a data set for cars uh, and the char characteristics. And there's another one that we'll get to later, which is the Ontario baby names, which is all the baby names of, uh, all the names of babies born in Ontario between 1914 and 2014 or something like that. And it's a much larger data set. It's 20 megabytes versus uh, just 13 kilobytes. Um, so 
we have uh, read CSV and it's in the data subdirectory. So that's relative to the current notebook. And then there's the name of the file. So if you execute this, uh, it will just add a number in here, but it won't, won't change any uh, output. And that means it worked. And if you get an error, it means that something did not work. Uh, one thing that might happen is that it's, this path is all relative to the current working directory. And the working directory is where your Jupyter notebook is. So everything is relative to that. So if you go back to the file manager, we can see we have our chapter one here. <coughs> and then there's a directory data. So, and the directory data has mpg.csv. So that means to get to mpg.csv, I need to go into the data directory first. So that's what I do here. I go into the data directory first, and then I go to mpg.csv. So if you want to view the data, um, we can type the object in which we uh, loaded our CSV data. So here we have pandas uh, read CSV. It loads the data and it stores it into this object or variable mpg. So to look at it, we type mpg, then shift enter, and we get a very long list of all the data that was in that CSV file. So here we have the index that's automatically generated by pandas. And then we have the manufacturer, model, uh, displacement, I think, year, number of cylinders, transmission, drive, uh, that was the city mileage, that's the highway mileage, fuel type, and class. So I had to remember those things. <laughs> uh, they came with the data set, so it's described in there, but uh, when you load it with CSV, that information is uh, not there, of course. So you can see it's quite a long list, and it goes all the way to 233. So that gives you 234 rows. And you'll notice that they start counting at uh, zero. So that's why it ends at 233. And you also have the triple dots here in the middle, which means it cut it down just not to overflow the entire screen. It's still a lot of data though. So if you want to just check the data, you can also look at uh, the first part. So mvg.head, and it's a function. So I have to use the, the, the round brackets that will just give me the first five entries. So that's a good way to uh, view the data, uh, to view if the data got imported correctly without uh, getting everything on your screen. You can also put in a number here to get uh, a different number. So if I put in eight, I get the first eight rows, or two, I get the first two rows. And there's also a function called tail, which is opposite of head, so that's the last uh, bit. And it also works with, uh, a number in here. So these are the last four, and you can see that's indeed the last four there. And if you want to get more information about uh, the structure of the data itself, and not just what it contains, uh, you can also look at the columns, like that. And you'll notice I do not have square brackets here, and that's because columns is a property of the data set. So that's a bit confusing because sometimes you have a function and sometimes you have a property. <laughs> uh, that's unfortunately just the way that uh, pandas is set up. So columns is a, uh, a property of the MPG dataset. So you do not want to type columns in there. Uh, you can also see uh, what the columns contain. So D types is short for D, uh, data types and it will tell you uh, what the columns contain. So manufacturing model or objects, that's because they're all string values. And displ uh, displacement is an integer number, so 2.0, 2.8, 2.8, 3.6. So that's known as uh, a float in Python uh, language. And then we have whole numbers, which is known as integers. And then we have some text again, some text again. So that says object again. And here we have some numbers, integers. 
Uh, you can also access uh, subsets of the data. So if we want, um, yeah, if you want to get just one column, we can do mpg dot and then the name of the column. So you can see we had a column manufacturer, model, uh, displacement, etc. If I just want to have a model, I can type uh, mpg, and let's just put it in here, mpg.model. And it will tell me all the models, as it will tell me what is contained in the model column. And it also works for the other ones. So we had a uh, field type. And that's a bit much, so we can again just look at the first three, and then we get the first three. Uh, you can also get uh, the rows if you want. So you can specify a range, and the range is separated by a column. So if I want to have uh, the first three, I go from zero to three, and I get the first three items. But I can also go from 10 to uh, 34, and then I get 10 to 34. Uh, yeah, to 34, so 34 is not included. And another one is I lock. So there is a difference between this number, which is the index, and there's also uh, the row index. And that's another confusing thing about pandas. Uh, we don't usually need iLock, but when we get uh, further and we do some data, manipula data manipulation, uh, it's going to matter. So I'll just briefly introduce it now and we'll go into more depth uh, later on. Um, so iLock is similar to um, what we use here. So mpg.iLock. And if I want to, I can say zero. So that's the zero row of my uh, data set and you can see I get the model, manufacturer, etc. Uh, but I can also put in a list in here. So if you remember, uh, the lists are contained in square brackets. So I have to put in more square brackets and this will get me elements uh, rows 1, 2, 3 and 4. So one, two, three, and four, and it matches the index. So this is going to be the same now, uh, but it can be different later. But you can also take whatever you want. So you can take the first, third, and seventh, and you get the first, third, and seventh. And you can combine this as well. So you can get the column, like model, and then arrange. So that gets you two and three of the model column. Uh, another way of getting to the models, to the columns, is using uh, the string. So I can also type this. That gets me the model column as well. So this is exactly the same as mpg.model. Uh, this does look kind of nicer. And also, if your column has a space in it, then you have to do it like that, because it's not possible to put in a space in here, because Python interprets the space as, oh, my command ended, I'll go to the next. Uh, and that doesn't work if this is not your full name. So if you have, <coughs> we don't have it in this data set, but if you would have a column like uh, model x, this will not this will not work, because you need mpg.model. And yet there's no way to specify that space, so you'll have to use that one. So now we get to the exercise, and based on that information, uh, oh, actually, I see a question. Uh, what then is the difference between mpg iloc uh, 0, 1, 2 and mpg 0 to 3? Yeah, so that difference is not quite clear right now. It's a difference between the index in the pandas or the row index in the array underneath pandas. And that's a bit confusing, I'll, I'll admit that. <laughs> Um, it will pop up later though, so I want to use it now and we'll get into more depth later on. So yeah, now we'll do exercise two, and that's a free parter. So we get, um, you. I want you to get the 10th row and the 20th row of the data frame. 
and the other one is I want you to show only the class column and then it's a bit more advanced I want you to show the columns manufacturer and model for the rows 2, 4, 8 and 13 so I haven't told you how to get multiple columns but if you follow the logic above you might be able to figure it out but don't worry if you don't it's just uh, the advanced one so I'll give you um, yeah, five minutes for that, so we'll continue at 10, uh, 10.02. Okay, so. Uh, I'm muted, yes, okay. So to get the, the tenth row of the data frame, um, the 10th to the 20th row of the data frame, uh, you can type mpg 10 20 and that will get you the 10th to the 19th row. Although it depends on how you define 10th uh, because uh, Python starts counting at zero. So technically you should have nine to 19. Nine is the 10th row because if you look at uh, from zero, then this would technically be the first row. So it depends on what you mean with tenth. <laughs> uh, if you want to show only the class column, you can type mpg class with uh, the quotation marks, and it will get you the class column. Uh, another way of doing it is uh, mpg dot class. Oh. Wait, why did that not work? Class. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> I see. Uh, Monica says uh, class is a code word. And uh, yes, he's totally right. So there are a few uh, words that you're not allowed to use in Python. Uh, class is if you want to do what's called object oriented programming in Python. Uh, we won't be touching that at all in this class, uh, this uh, workshop. Uh, but if you look up uh, class, it's one of the keywords in Python. So that means it's reserved and you cannot use it. So if you want to use columns, uh, it's usually better to use this formatting. And that means you'll never fall into the trap. And of course, this also works if you have spaces in your column names. I probably shouldn't have made that an exercise. Then. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and then the next one, uh, show the columns manufacturer and model for the rows 2, 4, 8, and 13. So I didn't tell you how to get uh, multiple columns, uh, but uh, the hint was that you can use a list like you did for uh, for iLog. So mpg and then list. Uh, what did I say? Model and manufacturer. So yeah, that will get me two columns, model and manufacturer. And then I want the rows. Uh, what did they say? Two, four, eight, and thirteen. So that's a list again. Two, four, eight, and thirteen. And that gets me rows two, four, eight, and thirteen. Oh. I forgot to tell you about this. <laughs> so I meant for you to run the function I'm done uh, whenever you're done with an exercise uh, because that will let me keep track of uh, the progress of the class. So for the next ones, uh, uh, if you do the exercise and then you're done, you can execute uh, the I'm done function uh, like that. And it will connect to uh, a server I have running and I have a Python program running there that will collect the data and make a nice uh, pie chart for me so I can see how the class is uh, progressing there. Uh, so finally, uh, there is also a function called describe. 
And that's also useful when you just load it in a new data set. Because what it does is mpg describe. It will describe the data. So here are my columns, not all of them, but uh, the first, uh, the numerical ones, because it cannot do anything with the strings. And it will give you statistics about uh, the data in there. So um, for the engine displacement, um, the mean engine displacement is 3.4. Uh, the mean year, <laughs> I mean, doesn't really matter in this, ones, this one much, but it's 2003.5. So that's the average year for all the um, all the years in the data set. So describe is just a handy function just to know about. So then we get to uh, data sanitation. Uh, so now we're going to use, um, oh wait, are there questions about? Yeah, okay, that's being handled, okay. Um, yeah, data sanitation. So you should never, ever, ever trust your uh, data set that you get, um, especially when you get it from somebody else, but even your own data set. So for instance, if you have uh, data for the baby names, uh, it's all collected by hand, right? So you go to, especially in 1913, so you go to uh, the, uh, the town, town hall, I forget the word. <laughs> anyway, you go to the city and um, you register your baby and they write it down on the form and that gets uh, submitted to some central repository. And then at some point, somebody uh, transcribes that data into a digital file. So there's all these steps in between where uh, things can uh, go wrong. So whenever you get a data set, you have to do some sort of uh, data sanitation. Uh, for this workshop, uh, in the data set is mostly sanitized, uh, but not completely. And that's just to illustrate uh, this point. So there's something called uh, Ontario's Open Data Platform, which has a lot of uh, data available for free. And this particular one, it contains the baby names for Ontario for the past 100 years. And it's already in our data. So if we look at the file manager data, it's Ontario baby names.csv file. So we want to load that data set. So similar to how you loaded MPG data set above, uh, this exercise, I want you to now load the new data set in data baby names.csv. So you may have to scroll up to see what the original command was. And if you are done with this exercise, then run this code below here, which says I'm done one, com uh, one comma three. So this should be a relatively easy exercise, uh, but I'll give you uh, two minutes for it. So until 10.14. Sorry, <laughs> uh, I just noticed that the name I put in here is not the correct one. Sorry about that. It should be Ontario baby names, because if you look in the file name manager, it says Ontario baby names at CSV. And I accidentally made it uh, into baby names. Uh, thank about, thanks uh, Matthew and Guillaume. Sorry, um, so it should be data, Ontario baby names, that's CSV. Uh, I'll just give you an extra minute for that, so 10.15, sorry about that. So yeah, um, I see a question from Rui. Can you shorten the name of the CSV file? Um, well, you can, I mean, when you uh, download your data set, you can give it any name you want. So yeah, you could use, just call it uh, o.csv and that will work as well. It's the name of the, the file that you're using. Yep. Okay, so to load the data set uh, into a new object called uh, baby names. Uh, actually, let's see. Uh, dashboard. How many participants do we have? Okay. Something like that. Uh, 
Oops. Not entirely sure how many partitions. Oh, we have 97. Uh, minus me and the helper, so that's 93. There we go. So most of the people have completed it. That's good. So, um, baby names is the name of our new object that we want to use. And to load the data, we need to use the, the pandas function uh, read CSV, like above. So it's pd dot read underscore CSV. And then brackets because it's a function. And then the name of the data on the disk. So that's data slash Ontario. Actually, I think tab works for this too. Oh, yeah. So you can use tab for auto completion as well, which is kind of nice. <laughs> It runs and you don't get any outputs, which means that um, um, that your data is actually loaded successfully. So if you want to see it, you can make a new cell and say baby names. And we get all the baby names that are in this data set for each year. And you can see we have 856,000 rows. So that's a lot of babies, although some of them have a count of zero. Um, yeah, so like I said before, uh, since the data is all collected by hand, uh, there's going to be some data that is wrong. You're going to have misspellings, uh, you're going to have people fill out the forms wrong or transcribe the, transcribe the data wrong. Um, so we can check the fields. Um, the syntax for that is already in here. It looks horribly complicated. Uh, we'll get back to this. <laughs> Uh, this is just for showing uh, what's in this data set, so you can see um, common mistakes for names, for instance. So what this does is it selects all the baby names that have a length of one. So baby names that only have one letter in them. So if I run this, I see I have babies named J, I have babies named M, I have babies named K. And it seems pretty unlikely that those are actual baby names. So very likely these are just uh, initials. So that's probably not right. Not right. Uh, so if you have this in a data set, you would likely purge that data so not to uh, mess up any analysis. Uh, but it does get more complicated. So if I want to look at the baby names with a length of two, I get Joe, which is probably a name. K? I haven't heard of K. I mean, it might be initials again, so K, A, or it's an actual name, uh, and so on. So, I mean, there are some Chinese names in here, probably. Uh, but you, So you need to do some further investigation to see if you want to keep those or if you want to get rid of those. So that depends on what you're trying to accomplish with this data. Uh, I see a question, is data frame a function or a dummy name for an input file? Uh, so a data frame is an object, but it's an object that has uh, properties and methods, which are like functions, except that they work on uh, an object. Uh, what does map mean? So map, uh, it's takes a function and it maps it to all the entries of uh, the column baby name. So here we have baby name, which is a, a column of all the names. And then map takes a function, in this case the function len, and maps it to all the, the baby names. So you'll get the length of each baby name. And then I compare it to two as a way of selecting things, which I'll get to later. And then I look for the unique names. Uh, don't worry too much about this code, it's more advanced and it will get clearer once we move on. So now it's time for a break, uh, but uh, one warning, uh, if you come back you might get this error, which says connection failed, a connection to the notebook server could not be established. Uh, this happens when um, uh, when a function, sorry, when the notebook, no, this happens when the connection times out, so there's a certain timer. And if you haven't done anything for so many minutes, I'm not entirely sure what it is, 
uh, it will disconnect. And if that happens, you need to go back to uottawa.ccg.ca, uh, log in again, and then you will see your notebooks with a green icon in front of it, which means it's still running. So you can click on it and then you are right back where you started. So I'll give a break time for about 15 minutes. So we'll come back at 10.36. Yeah, 10.36. Okay, see you in 15 minutes. 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, so it's 10.36. So we're ready to go to the next bit. So we can go back to the, <coughs> sorry, we can close this one because we're done with this one now. So you can choose, you can save it if you want. So if you save it, it gets saved. <laughs> and if you use file, uh, close and halt, it will uh, shut down the kernel and it will turn off the, uh, yeah, it will close everything down for you. So we'll go to chapter two now. So you have to go to uh, Python workshop 2020 may deploy and chapter two. Oh, I see Jane has an error in the chat there. Looks all right. Oh, sorry, Jane, I don't really see what you typed wrong there. Um, anyway, uh, let's continue with uh, chapter two there. So chapter two, uh, now we're going to uh, plot our data. So now we know how to load data. And now we want to actually see what the data looks like because you can look at numbers if you want, but I don't find them particularly illuminating, especially when you have a lot of them. So every time you start a, a new notebook, uh, you always need to import everything again. So we have import pandas as PD, import numpy as NP again, uh, but now we also will use plotting libraries. So we'll use notplotlib and from matplotlib, we will import pipot as plt. So we are importing a specific uh, part of matplotlib and we will refer to that as plt. It's just a uh, shorter again. And we'll also import uh, seaborn as sns. So seaborn is a really nice visualization package that will make pretty graphs and will also make it easy to work with. Uh, it's based on the matplotlib uh, uh, package, so it just built on top of that. Uh, then we have sns.set, which uh, sets up some uh, uh, like things like the color of the background and the grids and all that things. So we will select the cell and we'll press shift enter uh, to run it. And you can see that the number changed to one because this is the first cell that we've executed in this notebook. So make sure you uh, run this, otherwise you'll get all these errors uh, later on. And then the next one is more specifically for me. It will make the figures bigger so they're easier to see for you. So you don't have to do this if you don't want to and you'll get the normal size. Uh, I'll just uh, make it a bit bigger. Uh, and the same holds true for the data set. So we loaded the data set in our other notebook. But since this is a new notebook, we need to load the data again. So shift enter to load the data. And then that's to check. There is our data. Uh, let's see, did I say everything? Yes, I said that, okay. So here I also put in uh, the meaning of the fields. So I already mentioned it earlier, I think. But we have the manufacturer and the model, engine displacements in liter, year of manufacture, number of cylinders, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's just for, um, for our understanding of the data. So this is something that would come with any data set that you would download anywhere, uh, usually on the website itself, uh, sometimes incorporated in the data set itself. 
So uh, let's start with our first quiz. Uh, what relation do you expect to see between the engine size, so how large the engine is, how many liters it can contain, and the, the mileage on the highway? So larger engine size leads to a better or worse mileage, or it doesn't matter at all. So just put your answers in the chat and see what you think. Uh, like what would a bigger engine size mean for uh, mileage? So yeah, I see people saying uh, negative correlation, inversely correlated, uh, monotonic increase. Does that mean bigger engine size, larger mileage? Oh, yeah, decrease. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Um, so yeah, what you would expect is if your engine is bigger and bigger, uh, it would mean uh, a reduced mileage because the bigger your engine is, uh, the more powerful your car is and the more uh, fuel it's going to consume um, just to get uh, just to drive for one mile. So yeah, we want to uh, see that, of course. Um, so we're going to use uh, the Seaborn uh, package for that. So I will scroll up a tiny bit again to the import. You can see we imported Seaborn uh, as SNS. So every time we say SNS is when we call the Seaborn package. So we'll do that here, SNS uh, dot, and you can use uh, um, let's see. You can use tab to uh, see all the functions that are in this particular package. So you can see that uh, there are a lot of plots in there. Uh, we are going to use a scatter plot. Scatter tab. Oh, that doesn't work. Okay. Plot. Oh, <laughs> too impatient. Scatter plot. And then the first argument, uh, you can type the name of the column you want on the x axis. So we want to see the relationship between engine size and mileage. So we want to have engine size, which is this pole, on the x axis. And we want to have uh, mileage on the highway on the y axis. And now we also need to tell it uh, what data to use. So we loaded our data into an object called MPG. So we're going to say data equals MPG. And there you go. Uh, as the engine size becomes bigger and bigger, uh, your mileage decreases. So that's what most people in the chat are saying. Uh, you can also add uh, some more to it. So if you want to uh, plot uh, the, the dots in black, uh, you can add uh, color equals black. Then when you execute that, uh, you'll get the same graph, but now all the uh, yeah, now all the points will be black. So yeah, you can see there's definitely a downward trend for engine size versus mileage. And yeah, most people are expecting that. So bigger cars have bigger engines and they get less mileage. Uh, but if you look at these points over here, um, they kind of stick out. So they have big engines, uh, but they still get a reasonably good mileage. So what do you think that would be for? Uh, what is engine displacement? Is it the height of one cylinder? Uh, I'm not that familiar with cars. I just know that bigger engine displacement means it has a bigger engine. There's probably some car people in the chat that would be better able to answer that question. So anybody has any ideas of why these points, what kind of vehicles these would be that have a, a large mileage, uh, sorry, a good mileage, but big engines. So I see when the engines are manufactured, yeah, that's a good one. Newer uh, cars will have better mileage. Uh, electric cars, 
I don't think we have electric cars in our data set. It's also a bit hard to compare mileage for that, I suppose. Uh, I see diesel versus ga gasoline. Uh, trucks. Uh, hybrid. Oh, hybrid. <laughs> uh, yes, it could definitely be hybrid cars. Although hybrids, def hybrids, don't know, uh, hybrids do not have uh, really big engines. Like if you have a hybrid, uh, like a Toyota Prius or something, it will not have a massive engine. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, to find out, we can uh, use our data set and um, yeah, try to change our graph so that we can visualize what's going on there. And there's a function called uh, rel plot. Uh, let's see. So there's a function called uh, rel plot and that lets you color the points uh, based on other fields in the data. So you can change the, the color and the shape and the size of the, 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 the data points in your graph, uh, depending on the other fields in the data set. So the other fields we have uh, are manufacturer, model, or display we use already, uh, year, sale, transmission, and number of cylinders, transmission, uh, drive, um, city mileage, highway mileage, fuel type, and class. So we should try one of these. Um, yeah, so which one do you think? I think somebody already said fuel, so we can start with that. So the way to do it is we start with um, scatter plot. Oh, sorry, this should have been scatter plot. I'll just change that. Sorry, that should have been scatter plot. Uh, rel plot comes later. <laughs> so we had engine displacements and highway. And UE stands for the color, and we were going to color by fuel type. And data is MPG. So now we have our legend here, the fuel type P R E D N C. So that's uh, premium, regular. I don't know what E is. Diesel and C. Anyway, as you can see, uh, petrol, uh, premium, and regular. Uh, they're all over the place. Uh, there's not that much diesel in there. There's one here. There's one here. Uh, it does seem like the, the points that are the, the outliers, uh, they use uh, premium fuel instead of regular fuel. So I guess that's a hint. So let's get back to uh, the quiz. Um, so it's not uh, fuel. Like which owner one should you should we want to try? Like we have transmission. Number of cylinders, uh, trans, uh, the drive, like four wheel drive or two wheel drive, etc. Or did somebody say that already? Okay, I see people class. Oh, I have a question. What does UE do? So, UE lets you take uh, another column of your data set and color the data points based on uh, the value in there. So, I see lots of people use, say, class. Um, it's uh, sorry. The legend is now over the the data set, which is a bit annoying. Um, do I already say when? Yeah. Okay. I'll just copy that from here. <laughs> so what I just added now is a function to move the legend out of the way. So yeah, uh, the class of the car. So these are all two-seaters that are um, the outliers there. So these are the sporty cars. So now that makes perfect sense because uh, sporting cars are very light cars, which I think somebody said in the... Yeah, Elias uh, already said lighter cars, <laughs> turbo. So yeah, those are uh, qualifications of um, the two-seaters. So these are the sports cars that have really big engines but still get a pretty good mileage because they're really not heavy at all. So you can see that uh, just by uh, adding more data in your graph, now you're already able to uh, get some conclusions uh, from um, 
uh, from your data set. Uh, so see if a question about UI. Uh, so UI it's um, it's part of the color spectrum. So UI is the, the color. It ranges from red to uh, green, orange, blue, purple. Uh, it goes through the entire rainbow. Uh, so UI allows you to it's it's like color, but it's a component of color. Like it doesn't contain the, the brightness or the saturation and stuff like that. And when I use it in the function here, I ch I'll change the color based on whatever is in the, the in the data set. So if I go up to the data set, I have the class here. Actually, I should just show you the class. So I'll go. Make a new cell, uh, MPG. So we have compact, mid-size, SUV, two-seater, and every class gets its own color. So all the compacts, they get the color blue. Uh, so all the blue dots in here, those are the compact cars. And the same for the other ones. What if you want to get the scatter plot while fixing one parameter? Yeah, okay, uh, that is that will happen later on. <laughs> so yeah, we can also do the same thing with using size and style. Uh, they work the same way. So instead of uh, UE here, uh, you can use size or you can use style, or you can use them all together. Um, you can say UE. <coughs> you can say UE is class. Uh, size is uh, number of cylinders, and it will all be plotted in that plot. So that's your first exercise for this uh, chapter. Uh, you can try it out. So I already put in uh, the code as well, including the code for moving the legend. Uh, you can just copy paste this as it is. Um, what it basically does is it tells the uh, it tells PyPlot, the, sorry, it tells the plotting library, which is PLT to put the legend at uh, this position here, which is next to it. So you can just copy paste that. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, but just fill in the dot here, uh, change that to U equals something or size equals something or style equals something, etc. So I'll give you, um, let's see, five minutes to play with that. So 1058 and just try to make uh, a few plots and plot all the, the columns in different ways. And then when you're done, you can run the function, I'm done, which will let me know that uh, you've done the exercise. So five minutes is oh, 10.59. So I'll continue at 10.59. Okay, so that's five minutes. So you got to play a bit with uh, the data sets, <laughs> uh, with the data visualization, sorry. So yeah, we have UE uh, class, is one we already had. So that's a plot we had before. Uh, but you can add other things as well. So size equals, um, what else did we have? Number of cylinders. So you can see that uh, as the engine size gets bigger, the number of cylinders also increases, which makes perfect sense, of course. Uh, you also notice that the legend adds it for you. So the sizes are now connected to uh, the cylinders and the colors are connected to uh, the class there. And we also have style. And if you tried that one, you saw that you can get different markers. So, what should we use? Um, transmission, maybe? Oh, uh, sorry, let's just see at the data what we have. Oh, wait, did I do it wrong? Hmm. 
Why is it complaining about that? Okay, that works. So style is supposed to give you different markers for the different fields. Uh, but for some reason, it's not working for the other ones. So what do we have in the data set? We have FL, this is the field type. That works. Classworks, Drive. Yeah, so you can see uh, you can put in as much um, data as you want, uh, visualize as much as you want. So now we have the size, which corresponds to the number of cylinders. We have different markers that uh, feature uh, the drive. So the two seaters here, they all have a rear wheel drive. Uh, these all have, the circles all have um, four wheel drive, forward wheel drive. And then there's some four wheel drive as well here in the middle. And actually the four wheel drive one are generally the ones with uh, the lowest mileage which makes perfect sense which because they're probably pickup trucks and stuff like that, which aren't exactly known for their fuel economy. So yeah, there are um, different uh, ways of plotting these things, uh, but there's a distinction that you need to make and that can lead to the errors uh, sometimes because you can uh, select, uh, because you can have discrete uh, variables and continuous so the difference between that is, uh, for instance, class. Uh, if you look at the types of classes we have, we have uh, SUVs, we have pickups, yes, uh, two-seaters, uh, that sort of stuff. So those are discrete because you have a finite number of uh, possibilities. Uh, but if you have something like engine displacement, which is like 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, like that's a whole continuous range. Um, so that's, uh, how do I say that? Uh, it's different ways of interpreting the data because if you have, uh, for instance, the, the style uh, which changes the marker. So here we have the marker, we have uh, a disc, we have a cross, we have a square. Uh, but how would that work if you have a continuous var variable? Like uh, if you have one, uh, 1 1.0 and you say that's a disc, and you say 1.2 equals uh, across, then if you go uh, somewhere in between, you have some sort of combination between a disk and a cross. Like that doesn't make any sense. So you're not, uh, you cannot use uh, a style with a continuous variable and it will break and it will show you an error. Uh, another thing is that uh, for continuous uh, variables, uh, the color will behave differently. So if you use a continuous variable for your UE, so here I display, uh, plot display against, sorry, displacement against uh, mileage, and my UE, so the color of my points is now uh, a continuous variable, so in my case, dispel. So let's see. You can see these are all numbers from 1.8 to 6, 7. There's an entire range for it. Uh, so it's not possible to give discrete colors to that. So instead what it does is it makes the color change gradually. So it changes gradually from light uh, blue to uh, dark blue. And that's different from when we used uh, class here because then you got the primary colors. And now you get a color gradient of all the colors. And it's also not showing all the values for uh, displacement because we had uh, 1.2 and it's not going to show it here. Just 1.2 is between these two colors. So we have to take care of that. And this is just um, what it looks like for class. Takes a while. 
probably doesn't like uh, 100 of us being on this server. <laughs> so yeah, you can see the difference. You get the, the primary colors for uh, discrete variables and you get uh, the smooth range for continuous variables. So you just have to keep that in mind when you're trying to plot uh, your data, uh, if it's a discrete or if it's uh, continuous. And then we have another thing called uh, facets. Uh, so facets um, allow you to take certain parts of the data and plot those in their own graphs. So we could already show you uh, five things in our plot. So we have the x-axis, the y-axis, the color, uh, the size, and the shape. So we can cram five things in our plot. But if you want to e uh, get even more, we can uh, create individual plots. And there's a function called uh, relplot for that. So relplot is uh, what's called uh, a facet plot. And it allows you to get uh, the, the separate graphs. So I'll show you what it means. So relplot. So it's like short for re relational plot. And it's again uh, the engine displacement and the mileage. And now I use something called col, which stands for column. So I want my columns to mean class. So this will plot uh, a separate plot for each class um, in a different graph. So I have to say what my date is again, mpg. You can do it. Oh, that's taking a really long time. So it's supposed to show you, oh, there we go, <laughs> takes a while. Yeah, I think the server is just a bit overloaded since we're, we're so many now. The last time I did this workshop, it was with half the number of people. So maybe I'm pushing it a bit too far now. <laughs> anyway, now you can see we have uh, seven little plots and it's really tiny, but it says compact um, mid-size SUV. So yeah, it's really hard to read. So there's another parameter called uh, column wrap. It allows you to uh, wrap it in uh, rows. So if I say col wrap equals three, it will plot three columns and goes to the next row, uh, print three columns again, etc. So it's probably going to take, actually I wrote it down here, so I'll just execute that one. Well, this will make the workshop take a while, I guess. Oh, Colonel and Space have died. <laughs> so I think I've pushed it too far. Um, yeah, you can see it says dead kernel in here right now. So that means it crashed. Let me just try reloading it. Doesn't feel like it. Okay, I'm going to interrupt the kernel. Actually, I'm going to restart the kernel. Restart. 
Okay, so now it's gone. I'll load my libraries again. And I'll load the data again. Oh, it looks like other people have this same issue. Oh, that doesn't build well. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the star means it's running, but if it's not... Oh, kernel starting, please wait. Yeah, I had asked them about it. It said it would be fine for 100 people, but it looks like it's too much. Okay, I'm going to switch to the backup server so I can at least show you things. <laughs> um. So this is going to be troublesome for the exercises, uh, but I have a backup server just in case uh, CCG went down, so I at least can <laughs> do stuff still. Um, but we'll see what happens when we get to the exercises. So we did... Right, so we had the column wrap. So we had this without call wrap. And we got these plots, and now with call web free, I'm going to web the columns, and you can see they're a lot bigger now. So, because I use call web free, I have three uh, columns per row. Here are the other three, and then finally, we have one over here as well. And that's. Yeah, so that lets you split out the data. And you can also do it by row. Uh, so I will move uh, call wrap because if you use rows as well, uh, then you cannot use uh, call wrap. So row equals, uh, what else can we do? So we have a different plot for every class. And yeah, this should also be a discrete variable because you can imagine if you use a continuous variable, then you cannot make a separate plot for every possible value in between a range. So let's put in the field type. Oh, and I get the error invalid syntax now uh, with a helpful um, caret, I think it's called. Circumflex, whatever. Um, so I can it looks like there was an error here, and the error I made is that I forgot my comma. So there's a comma that should be there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's debatable how useful this is, of course, <laughs> because we get, uh, for each class, we get a column, and for each row, we get the field type. So here we have all the field types in the row, and you can really read it, and all the columns is um, at a class. And then on top of this, on top of this, yeah, sorry, on top of this, you can also use uh, UE and style and shades with this as well. So you can color all the individual dots, make them different markers, etc., and just get one mega graph. And that allows you to put in seven different uh, data, uh, seven different uh, data columns in one single graph. But really, at that point, you're just pushing it probably too far. So then, for formatting, 
um, there are ways to format uh, the things. So if we just have the scatter plot that we had before. Oops, with our colors and our data sets. So yeah, we had that before. So the Y column is uh, mileage and the X column is uh, displacement. But you don't really want to give anybody this graph because they wouldn't know what displacement is. I mean, you might be able to say it early on, but it doesn't look very pretty. Uh, sometimes you also want to give a title to your plot uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, so the way to do that is with um, set title, set X label and set uh, Y label. And then you can change the, the text of the legend as well. So I'll show you that. So I'll take my plot here. And I assign it to an object. So if I say p equals uh, SNS scatter plot, then p will now contain my plot. And then I can manipulate uh, my plot by uh, giving it a title. So fuel efficiency. And if I plot that, now my plot has fuel efficiency as the title. And then they can continue, set X label, displacements. I can set the Y label. Uh, that is mileage on highway. And you can see that X label and the Y label changed. Uh, another thing you notice is that you get text and then it always corresponds to uh, uh, the last text you entered in here. So if you don't want to see that, you can make a dummy command that has no output and it's called pass. So if you use that, pass does nothing, so it will output nothing. And you can see that the text disappeared now. It just makes it a bit prettier. Uh, yeah, and then we have the legend. The legend is a bit more tricky. You have to do some <laughs> arcane magic almost. <laughs> so this text here that we have before, uh, that is what we use to take this legend and put it to the side. Uh, but we can also access the text in it. So text zero means the, the first text because in Python you start counting at zero. So that this corresponds to the word class here. And then I say set text vehicle class and it will change class to vehicle class. So if I run this whole thing, I get my vehicle class here. I get my title, my Y axis and my X axis. So now I get a properly marked up figure that you can use for uh, sending to people on its own. Uh, we've also used a uh, rel plot. So rel plot is uh, slightly different because we're not plotting just one thing. Uh, we're plotting uh, lots of things because we have different plots for each uh, subsection of the data. So it means that the commands change a tiny bit. So for if I use rel plot, uh, if I use rel plot instead of scatter plot, but I don't use row or column, I just get one facet plot, and that's what I use here for simplicity. Um, so I just get a one by one facet plot, which looks identical to what we've plotted before. And this is just to show you how you would access uh, the names, uh, the titles of each of one of them. So it's again P, but now we have to use axis zero zero and then set title. So before we had P dot set title and now we have P dot axis zero zero set title. And zero, 00 corresponds to the zeroth column, the zeroth row, or the first row, the first column, if you use normal English. <laughs> and then we have set title and etc. And here we used uh, set x label because you're only setting the label for the x axis. But here we have multiple uh, x axis, so we use x set labels, so it's plural. 
and the same for the Y. Uh, the legend is also different because for a rel plot, do I still have that? Or is that in my other notebook? Yeah, no, I still have that. So for my rel plot, I have my uh, legend over here. So it's different again from the scatter plot. Uh, where is it? Here. So now we use underscore legend. We take the first text, which is again the uh, the first text in my legend, and then we use set text. So if I execute that, I get the same thing. So I have my x-axis, y-axis, uh, the title, and the title of my legend. So if you use this in the future for plotting yourself, uh, just copy it from my notebook here. Uh, everybody will have access to the files after the workshop. Actually, you already have access to the files because you're working them right now. Uh, and then there are lots and lots of other plot types as well. So, so far we've used scatterplot and we've used relplot. And relplot uses scatterplot internally, so we've really only used uh, one. Uh, but there are lots of different ones. So you can click on a link here. It will open, open a new browser. And you can see we have the relational plot. So we have rel plot, which contains scatter plot and line plot. We have categorial plots, and they contain all these other ones. We have the distribution plots, regression plots, matrix plots, and then the multi grid plots. Those are the facet grids that we've used before. And there are really a whole bunch of them, the color palettes, other palettes, and some other function that we won't use. <laughs> and the help is really good because if you go to scatterplot and you click on that, you get the scatterplot function that we've been using. And you have all the variables that you can, all the arguments you can give to this function. And a description of all the things that they mean. So as you can see, there are a lot of them. Uh, but also they have a lot of examples. So they have examples on how to uh, show you the data. So import seaborn as SNS and SNS set and import mod.lib is something we already did. So you can just execute, you can copy this text, copy it to your own notebook and you can execute the sample just like that. So let's do copy that, go back to the notebook. Uh, Make a new cell. Oh, it puts it under there. Oh, sorry, I forgot to copy the other part here. Yeah, that copy, paste. So I just copied uh, the text from. Uh, I copied the text here from the example. And then I can execute it, and I get the same plot as they had in examples. I mean, it's bigger because I make my figures bigger, but essentially it's the same one. And they have lots of examples. So you can use that to see what the function can do. And then you can modify the example based on what you want to do. So now I had planned an exercise. Uh, let's just get rid of that cell. I had planned an exercise. I don't know if CCG has recovered by now. So I'll just go back to CCG. It looks like it ran. Let's go to the exercise. Exercise. Okay, am I allowed to plot this? Let's see. Yeah, okay, so CCG is responding again. So if you had uh, the, um, the dead kernel, you can use uh, this button here to uh, restart the kernel. And once you've done that, you can scroll all the way up and you need to execute the first cell here and you need to read the data. And once you've done those two things, uh, you're back to where you were before. And then you can do exercise uh, 2.2. So what I want you to do is I want you to go to um, the Seaborn website and just copy a few of the examples and try to play with them and try to see. I mean, you can use other ones too, like the swarm plot. You can scroll down, you can see the data like here.
yeah, so just try to look at the documentation and copy some uh, examples and then see how far you get. Uh, I set five minutes for that exercise, uh, but since CCG might be of trouble and you need to execute that, uh, I'll give you 10 minutes instead. So we'll continue at uh, 11.36. So good luck. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like some people still have stuff for overloaded errors. That's unfortunate. Well, this should be the most intensive uh, chapter. The next chapters are going to be uh, less intensive, so it should be better then. <laughs> uh, plotting these graphs, it takes a lot of CPU power. It's still working. It's still working. Okay. So yeah, um, let's move on to uh, the next exercise, and that's to recreate a specific figure. And I want you to recreate this uh, figure. Uh, so you've looked at the documentation a bit, um, and this is uh, like this is a, a box plot that I want you to uh, recreate. So I want you to uh, look at the documentation, uh, find the box plot, and uh, try to recreate this figure. So with uh, this order, uh, with the... Oh. Uh, okay, I guess I should try logging in again. Leave, sign in. Okay. <laughs> oh, that is kind of annoying. Okay, what to do about that now? I should probably contact the CCG people. They're probably wondering what's going on. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. Can I skip this exercise? Yeah, we're almost at the. Um, uh, maybe punt on a serve for now. Just show us the rest of the plotting. Yeah, okay. So, looks like we can't do these exercises for now. I'll have to wait for CCG to come back up because uh, the backup server I have, it's meant for handling like 10 users at most. There's no way it can handle 100. <laughs> so I'm not going to try that. Um, anyway, the plan was to recreate this uh, figure here uh, using, the, uh, using the documentation. So if you go back to the documentation page, um, there is a box and plot here. And if you scroll down, oh, sorry, it's not that one. Uh, box plot, right, sorry. <laughs> and if you scroll down, yeah, so this already looks like what we want. Um, if you go back to the figure we want, uh, there's a mistake here, this should have been SUV. I accidentally used pickup again. So I want to plot uh, this figure. So that is sns.boxplot. And I want to do it for class versus uh, fuel, fuel efficiency in highway. And if I plot that, Uh, did I do it wrong? So I'll check uh, x equals y equals. 
oh, I forgot the data. <laughs> so I try to uh, make a plot uh, without uh, saying what data. Oh, <laughs> I see lots of people correcting me in the chat, which is a very good sign. There we go. So now I have a plot that already looks a lot like what we had before, uh, except this is two-seater compact mid-size, etc. And I have compact mid-size SUV, two-seater, etc. So I want to change uh, the order. So I go to the documentation and I have a look of all the things that I can put in. And one of the things I can put in here is order. So I can say order equals, and what does it take? It takes a list of strings. So I have to give it a list of strings. So lists are with the square brackets, strings are with the quotation marks, and I want two seater compact uh, mid size mini fan pickup sub subcompact. And that should have been SUV instead of pickup. So yeah, that looks very much the same. Except I need to still do um, the x-axis, the y-axis, and the plot title. And for that we can use p equals to save the plot into the object. And then set title, uh, what did I say, fuel efficiency per class and I want to set the X label which is class of vehicle set Y label uh, fuel efficiency in miles per gun So now we have the same thing. Uh, I mean, the font size is not uh, quite right. Uh, that has to be done through a different trick. And in case you're wondering where I got this from, uh, we had that before. So I just used the same as before for scatter plot. So that also works for the box plot. And there's also this text, and if I don't want that, I can put in pass, and it's gone. So if you want to change the, the font size, um, you have to do it like this. There's not an easy way of doing it that I could find, so that's a bit too bad. And uh, what this does is it sets the X labels, but it gets the X labels, and it just specifies extra one size. And there's two ways of doing it. Yeah, you can have uh, tick labels and you can have ticks. And the difference is that tick labels, it gets uh, the text labels. And white ticks, it gets the numerical values. So what I mean with that is here I have the class of the vehicle, which is two-seater, compact, mid-size, etc. So those are pieces of text. So those are labels. Uh, but here I have the fuel efficiency, which is a number. So those are not labels. Those are uh, like a continuous range of numbers. So for this one, I should use uh, ticks. And for this one, I should use ticks labels. So I can do that here. Set x tick labels. And I need to get x ticks labels. And I say the size should be, this is a font size 8. And now you, can, now you can see that the text is indeed smaller. And I can do the same for the, the Y axis. Set the Y tick labels. Y tick. So if I would have used Y tick labels here, like that, uh, then it doesn't plot anything because there are no labels. So I want uh, uh, the Y ticks. 
and then now we get the numbers in a smaller font size. So that's just a bit more advanced, uh, uh, making for bigger, making better figures. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the surface probably still broken, isn't it? Uh, let's go back to CCG. No, still broken. So we won't be able to do exercise 2.4 either. Let's see. Oh, I'll leave that as an exercise. Uh, I'll send the solutions to... Um, actually, no, I should just do it. So if I go back to the documentation, I want to create a histogram. And I think they call that a count plot. Show the counts of observations in each categorical bin using bars. So that's probably the histogram that we need. Yeah, that looks promising. Oh, no, wait, that's not the one. It's a distribution. So I think it's KDE plot. Nope. Mm, let's see. Oh, this is the one. This looks like it. Uh, yeah, I see people in the chat already found this function. This plot. Thank you. <laughs> So as you can see, I'm just doing exercises with you. <laughs> so this plot, SNS dot this plot, and I want to plot uh, a histogram, which means I need to uh, feed it a, a list of numbers, and I need to get one specific column for that. So I will get the column information for highway, uh, not hi highway mileage. I think it's like this. Yeah, okay. So you can see it plots the histogram. It also plots the, I forget what it's called. It's the fit over the data. And we don't really want that. So we go to um, the documentation and it says here whether to plot the histogram, we want that. Whether to plot the Gaussian kernel density estimate, and we don't want that. So that's KDE, and it wants a, a Boolean, which means it has to be either true or false. So KDE, we don't want it, so we set it to false. That looks a bit better. We also want to change the color. So color. Uh, color to plot everything except for the curve. So that sounds good. Uh, color uh, black. Oh. Black. That looks like it. But here the, the columns are not as wide as we have here. So we need to change that as well. So here is the bins. So that's the number of bins that you put in. We go back. Bins equals. Uh, I'm not sure what the number was. That's that's too much. How much do we need? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. And it completely reproduces the plots. You can also see I didn't bother with uh, the labels this time. So this is just uh, one on one. And another nice thing, uh, another thing that you probably want to do once you've plotted data is that you want to save the data. So one way of doing it is you can right click on the plot and you can save the image, uh, which is a very uh, handy way. <laughs> Uh, but it always saves it as a PNG file, which is maybe not what you want. Uh, the other way of doing it is uh, p get figure save figure. And then you specify uh, the path where you want to save it. So if I do p, did I give this a name? I did not give this a name. So I give this a name, p equals something. Now my figure is stored in p. 
Now if I want to save it, I get the figure. And then I save the figure. And then I give it a name. So it's an extension. So if I use PNG, it will save it as a PNG file. Now it's saved. And if I go to my file browser, I can see the file has been saved uh, seconds ago. So that's new. And I can open it. It's a PNG. I can also save it as other files. I can save it as a JPEG. Oh, I cannot save it as a, sorry, I can save it as a SVG. So an SVG is a scalable factor graphics. And it's a really nice format because it gives you infinite resolution. So if you want to embed it in PDF or print it or whatever, uh, SVG is a, a really good format. And if I look in here, here the SVG. Oh, it's opening it as a text file. But normally, if you open it in uh, an image editor, it will do it correctly. And then a bit word about uh, combining plots. So if you want to combine plots, so for instance, you have your scatter plot. So that's the one we had before, the scatter plot of versus. And data is npg. So that's our plot for just uh, just the scatter points. Uh, I can also do another one, which is the line plot, which you may have come across when you looked at the documentation. So this attempts to draw a line through all the data. It even puts in the, the confidence intervals here. And if I want to combine them, I can type both lines in the same cell. And if I execute that, uh, my data will be overlaid on top of each other. So you get uh, both uh, data in the same plot. So we can also change the color scheme. So there are different uh, palettes available. I have put in a link in the notebook here. If you click on it, it's all the color palettes that are available. It's actually the same link I said before, it's just scrolled down. So we have uh, color palettes, dark palettes, light palettes, diverging palettes, etc. And you can plot them with palette plot. So that's palette plot. And then some color plot that has a certain name. Uh, the names you can look up on the internet. Uh, and then the number of um, the number of colors you want. So here I asked for 10 colors of the palette blue is D. And you can see I can get 10 colors. I can get more if you want. And then those will be the colors being used. You can also use a diverging palette. So it goes from one color to another color. And this value is a value from uh, 0 to 255. And it corresponds to red all the way through the rainbow. So I think this is green to red, and I want nine of them. So if I plot that, oh, sorry, it was blue. From blue, it goes to red uh, through uh, the center. So this is a diverging, which means you look at the deviations. So if you plot something which has values from minus 10 to 10, then the negative values would be blue and the positive values would be red. So that's a very handy one to have. Um, if you set the, uh, the palette like that, uh, it will be used for all the plots, and you may not want that. So what I use is width. So you can use width, palette, and then column. And then on the next line, with the spaces, that's very important. And then you do your plot. So if I execute this, you can see the classes have taken this palette here. And I had to match the number here to the number of classes I have. Because if I, if I make more, so for instance, if I were to have 19, I would have all these colors. And if I have 19 here, it only takes the first seven. Because it only needs seven colors, because there's only seven classes. So I try to make this match. And then you get the full range of this diverging uh, palette. 
And yeah, with that, uh, let's start with the lunch time and I'll contact the CCG people to see if I can get it back up. <laughs> I certainly hope so. Uh, so we'll be back at one o'clock and enjoy your lunch. <laughs> So, hello everybody. Um, so I've been in contact with uh, the CCG server admins. Uh, they're resizing the server so it will have a lot more memory for us. Uh, it's not quite done yet, it sounds like. Uh, but it should be done any minute soon. So I think I'll just go through the notebooks and wait for them to email me and say it's okay to use again. Um, I mean, I need to do, do a bit of theory anyway. So let's see. Um, this is on the backup server, so that is fine. I can close this anyway. Uh, let's go back to the main page. Let's see. Chapter 3. Okay, let's just check. Uh, how do I get. You back? You're not back. Okay. So I'm opening uh, Chapter 3 and. In the meantime, I will wait for the email from the CCG people to say it's okay again. Uh, so this is chapter three. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, data manipulation. And Pandas is a library that is extremely well suited for data manipulation. Uh, you can select data, you can transform data, you can uh, do statistics on it, you can do all sorts of things. Um, so since this is a new notebook, I will have to load the libraries again. So I'll in execute uh, the first cell. And I want my figures to be bigger, so I do this one, but you don't have to. Uh, once they are back online, of course. Uh, then, of course, I started with an exercise, which we won't be able to do right now. Uh, but you've done this twice already, so let's see. Baby names. CSV, Ontario baby names, so now I have my whole list of uh, baby names here, which is 800,000 uh, names. Oh, I see one person is able to log in, I uh, should probably still wait for the OK from the CCG people though. <laughs> Lots of people can get in. Uh, I'll just go through the theory and then we'll see how it goes. <laughs> uh, so selecting data. Um, to select data, um, we can use... Um, no, sorry, I should start over. Uh, because now we're going to uh, talk more about uh, the iLock that we had in our first chapter. And I mentioned that iLock and indices, oh, email, sorry. Hi, Yarno, all done. I should point out this is essentially a new machine, so some things might be a little different, except user home directories. So let me know if you run into any problems. Okay, so it sounds like CCG is back up. So let's go to CCG. And of course I have to log in again. Uh, I suggest you do the same thing. So let me just do that in slow motion. <laughs> so if you go to ccg.ca and you go to launch and you select U Ottawa, we'll get you to this page where you can sign in with your University of Ottawa account again. So log in. And then you log in with your UO access credentials. I'm 
my verification code, which some of you won't have. Cool, it works. And then you go to Python Workshop 2020 May Deploy, which is the files that you downloaded earlier. It should still be there. And we will open chapter three. So that should open chapter three of you for you. And if this doesn't work for you, let me know in the chat and we'll see what we can do. <laughs> Anyway, the, the first uh, step here is to load the libraries again, like I said. So select the first cell and press shift enter to load all the libraries. These are the same libraries as in chapter two, but because this is a new notebook, we have to do it again. And that I'll let you do exercise 3.1 on your own. I know I just showed you the solution, but <laughs> I hope you remember. So I want you to uh, load uh, the date Ontario babies names.csv and store it in the object uh, baby names. And then when you're done, you can run the code, I'm done three comma one. Oh, and I'll give you uh, two, three, well, two minutes for that. So 1309, just so you can open the notebook for people that have trouble logging in. Okay, so yeah, uh, like before, we name our object baby names, and we use the pandas library, which is shortened as pd. Read the csv file, which is located in data Ontario baby names dot csv. And then you can check with baby names head to see if it loaded, and you should see uh, some data in there. So yeah, for selecting the data, um, I mentioned before you can select it by indices. Uh, so that's these bold numbers here in the beginning. Uh, or you can uh, access it by uh, by row, uh, by row index, uh, using the iLock function. So iLock is a much more raw access of the data. Um, so it's a lot faster and you'll see later that the index uh, now it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 so it matches exactly the row index but later on we'll see that it can actually be different things as well uh, so what it does when you uh, access the data like this so baby names like that then you will get rows 2, two, uh, two to 4 so 2 and 3 uh, it will actually compare every index to that number. Uh, that is not a very efficient uh, way of doing things. So if instead you use iLock, it will access it by row index, and that's super fast. Even though Shano, now, can you please share your screen? Oh. We don't see your screen. I don't see it. Oh, it says it's still sharing. Let me reshare. How's that? Oh, I see lots of people in the chat saying I can see it. <laughs> fine, fine, it's okay now. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so iLock is a lot faster. Um, so now we have a data set that's uh, very substantial, like 800,000 rows. Uh, now it matters if you use iLock or uh, index. So if you want to get the 123,457th element, then you can type uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then you want the third column. So that's 0, 1, 2. 2 is the third column. And then you get the name alien, uh, because the third column is uh, 1, 2, 3, name. So the 123rd, 456th entry is uh, alien. <laughs> Uh, but there is some peculiarity here. Um, 
so before in chapter one I said you could access uh, baby names uh, using this notation here so oh <coughs> I should not have pressed it but there we go <laughs> uh, if you that's the one I meant I said you could access the column by baby names and then uh, a column name so it's year it will get you all the years <coughs> uh, but if you instead use uh, the double double brackets so you actually feed a list into baby names even though that list has only one entry you'll notice you get uh, a different formatting so let me just put that back to what it was there and there so you can see the difference uh, here without uh, using a list so just uh, single square brackets uh, you get uh, an array a python array or rather a python list uh, whereas if you use uh, double brackets then you get a data frame back so now because you get a data frame back it means you can use all sorts of um, operations specifically for data frames which you would lose if you were to do it with single bra brackets so i would recommend using the, the double brackets whenever you can because then you'll keep the functionality for data frames. So that brings us to uh, how to access data. So it's a kind of a short recap of chapter one uh, with some additional info. info. Uh, and now we're going to use that because, um, so do not run this code by the way, because CCG will not like that, especially after what we just did. Um, if you, take all of the baby names and you plot it, it's going to try to plot 800,000 points. And as you can imagine, it's going to take a long time. And especially if everybody does it at the same time, uh, it's going to be a very, very bad idea. So don't run this code. Uh, instead, what we want to do is we want to take a certain name, for instance, or a certain year or like a subset of the data and we want to plot that. So the way we do it is we set some sort of condition and we select on that condition. So this is called uh, selecting data. So baby names is the name of our data set, contains all the names. Uh, but if you want to have a selection with a condition, you can do the square bracket and then you can do baby names name. So we're asking for the name, oh, baby names. And we say it should be equal to something. So suppose you want to know the baby names for Mary. So we'll get all the babies named Mary. And now you can see we have 200 rows and five columns. So we now have a subset of our data. Uh, instead of the entire data set. You can also see that the indices are not running from 0 to 1. So you actually have a, a sub subset of the data. And that's what we want, because we want um, just part of the data. We want to ju just look at uh, Mary. Uh, this is wrong. That should be plot. <laughs> so I want you to do this now uh, in exercise uh, 3.2. Uh, so here we selected on the baby name uh, Mary. And in this exercise, I want you to search for your own name. So that will give you a sense on how popular your name is over the data set. And if you get a big error, uh, that means that your uh, name is not in the data set. And that means that you'll need to pick uh, another name. <laughs> Uh, it also means that you're very, very unique in Ontario and like there's less than five people with your name. So you should be very happy about that. <laughs> so I'll give you uh, two minutes for that. So we'll get at 13, 18. And of course, when you're done, run the I'm done function. So yeah, uh, try to get uh, your own name. Oh, can I increase the zoom on my browser? Sure. Mm, 
It's a bit much. Yeah. Thanks for fresh <laughs> Oh, I see somebody is stuck on reading the data. Oh, I see. Yeah, so um, for this exercise, all you need to do was uh, fill in the triple dots with your own name. And you can see uh, if I put in my name, I just get an empty uh, list back. Uh, my name is not very common at all <laughs> in Ontario, which is, gets not surprising. So I'll just use Emily or Fitz, there are lots. And you can see uh, from, I used head, so I get the, only the first five entries. And now I can see as a function of time, the popularity of uh, the name Emily. So in 1917, there were 64 Emilys born, etc. Oh, yes. Um, if you have a name that is uh, used by both sexes, you'll get uh, both, um, both female and uh, male baby names. So for instance, Alex is a name that's uh, commonly used for both males and females. So if I look at the beginning of the list, so with head, I can see they're all females. But if I look at the bottom of the list with tail, I get the male Alexes. So both data sets uh, exist in that case, if there's both male and females using those baby names. So then we get to the logical tests. So you can see here, we use the double equal sign to do a comparison. So we're looking for the baby names that equal Alex or Emily or whatever. Uh, I think I used Emily for this example. Um, but there are others as well. So here's the double equal sign, X equals to Y. Uh, there are others as well. So smaller than is indicated by uh, that symbol, larger than, and then we have large or smaller than or equal to, larger than or equal to, and this means not equal to. So that allows you to get the babies that are not named Marie, for instance. Uh, there's another one, uh, is in. So X, which is your data frame, uh, is in. So that will let you uh, select and select on multiple multiple names. So if I were to do baby names is in, and I would put in here, uh, Emily, Alex, I would get both at the same time. Uh, one thing you should notice, uh, sorry, if I, yeah, so this works for the selection, but it's also something that works in Python in general. So if I have an object called X and I assign the value one to it, so, I assigned one to the value one to the object x. You can see it's one. And if I then say x is larger than two, so then Python will test one larger than two. Uh, that's not right. So this will return false. So based on what the input is, you either get true or false. And those are the Boolean values. So now we get to our first quiz which I see some people already answering. <laughs> so yeah, for you, uh, from chapter one, we saw uh, various possibilities like a one or a one with the quotation marks for uh, values. And now we also get another value called uh, nan. And this is noted uh, np.nan because it's part of uh, NumPy. So np was NumPy, the short name. So here's your question. Um, what do you think uh, nan stands for? You can answer in the chat there. Although I guess Christian already answered it. <laughs> yeah, so exactly, it's uh, not a number. You're going way too far ahead, Christian. <laughs> so yeah, let's get to the next quiz then. Uh, so here we have the comparison, uh, one equals equals one. So without typing that into Python, uh, what do you think the results would be for this? You can also type that in the chat. So it's just true or false. Yeah, everybody says true. 
so that's great. <laughs> okay, and now what? One equals not a number. Is that true or false? Yeah, everybody says false, and that's correct. But now what? Is not a number, is that the same as not a number? Is this true or false? Okay, is it true, false, undefined, false, syntax error? Yeah, so this is a tricky one. So this is actually false. So it looks like it should be true, because the thing on the left looks like it's the same as the thing on the right. Uh, but it's not actually the same thing, because not a number means it's undefined, like it's not actually a thing. So you're comparing something that you don't know what it is to something else that you don't know what it is. Is that the same thing? Well, it's not the same thing. I mean, it might be the same thing, but Python regards it as not the same thing. So this will actually return false. You can type it in. False, because it's comparing two unknown uh, quantities. And they are not the same, because you don't know if they could be the same. So we can add that to our list. Uh, this is the table we had before. But now we can also add is an A or is not an A. So here we have an exclamation, port, exclamation mark which inverts the, the value. So is an A means this is not a number, it's a missing value. This says it's a missing value, but then with the not symbol it becomes it's not a missing value. So those are all the logical tests you can do uh, with Python. So now we're going to use that. Um, we're going to use um, the same method as before. So I'll just scroll up a bit to where we did the selection. So this is how we do the selection. Uh, baby names, and then baby names in the column, the logical compar comparison, and the value you're comparing it to. So that's the, the form that you should use. So now you can do exercise 3.3. Uh, and I want to get all the rows where the column prop is greater than or equal to 0 0.06. And I also want you to find all of the children named Alberta. And then when you're done, you can do I'm done 3.3. Uh, sorry, 3 comma 3. And I'll give you five minutes for that. So that's 13, 20, uh, 13, 30, Yes, 1333. <laughs> yeah, okay, so let's see. Um, we want the rows where prop is greater than or equal to 0 0.0, 0, yeah, 0 0.06. So we use baby names and just, oh, oops. And let's look at the column prop. So that's the one we're interested in. And we want that one to be uh, larger than or equal than 0 0.06. You actually get something like that. So that's for each row in the data set. You either have true or false, and it's only true if the value for that particular row is uh, 0 0.06. So then this we put in the square brackets. and. We want that for baby names. And now we get all the baby names that have uh, a prop, which actually means uh, the proportion of babies for that year uh, is larger than uh, 0 0.06. So these are the baby names that were for that year more than 6% of all the babies born in that year. So David and Joseph were some of the most popular names of all time. Like they were in 1959, 1960, uh, the name David was by far the most popular name with more than 6% of all the babies. So if you want to know the baby names uh, that are named Alberta, so name is Alberta. 
And then we get all the babies that were called uh, Alberta. So Albert, I think it's actually a Dutch name. I mean, it's not an uncommon name for <laughs> people in the Netherlands, but maybe it is for those in Canada. So I don't think they're named after the province. That's just a Dutch name. <laughs> Uh, I see a question, could you have both two filters? Yeah, I will get to that. <laughs> so common mistakes that you can do here is if you use the single equal signs instead of the double equal sign. So the single equal signs is an assignment operator. So I have something called x equals 1. That means I set x to be the value 1. But if I do double, then I say x or is x equal to one. So you change it from a statement to a question, basically. Uh, another thing that's uh, often uh, a mistake that I do all the time is that I forget uh, the quotation marks. So for instance, for baby names, if I do it without the quotation marks, now I'm comparing baby names to the object called Alberta. And there is no search object, so this will result in an error saying Alberta is not defined. Because this it's looking for the object called Alberta. So you should have quotation marks around it. So I saw, just saw this question in the chat to combine them. And yes, you can combine them. So there are uh, symbols for combining them that stand for and uh, and or. And also not. And also the square brackets allows you to uh, group these tests. So it's, there's a difference between data frames and variables. If you do it in the data frames, you have to use these symbols. If you use it in Python code itself, you have to type and or not the actual word. Uh, here we're just are interested in data frames, so we'll be only using the first column here. But if you ever start coding in Python, uh, writing your own scripts, uh, then you have to use these keywords for that. So here's an example. Uh, I set x equals to 2. And then x larger or equal than 2. And x smaller than true. So the first statement here, x is larger or equal to 2. That's true. So this changes to true. And this test here, x is smaller than 3, which is also true. So that's this one. And then it evaluates true and true. And since they're both true, the result is true. And so you can combine those uh, by uh, you can combine those in the selections. So here we have the selection. So this is either true or false. And if you want to uh, combine it with other uh, with other tests, so apply multiple filters. Uh, you have to put this in brackets, and then you can use the logical operator, so OR, and this is N, and then you do another uh, filter in there. So you just add them like that. And you can use the brackets over the whole top, like that, and then you can do something else. So you can make it as big as you want. And that's going to be exercise uh, 3.4. So now I want you to find uh, the boy babies named Mary. So a lot of babies uh, were called Mary, even though they were boys. So it was uh, a male name too for some time. I also want you to find the names that were used exactly five or six times in 1920. And I want you to find all the names, all the babies that were named either John, John, Johnny, or Johnny. So I left some space here for you. Uh, if you need more cell cells, you can use the plus here. And then when you're done, you can use I'm done 3, 4. And I'll give you, um, well, seven minutes for that. So that's 14.45. Yeah, okay. So it's 1.45. Uh, so let's see. We want to find uh, the boys named uh, Mary. So if you look in our data set, names uh, oops uh, we see you have the columns uh, year sex name count and uh, prop so proportion 
and we want the baby names named Mary. So the name should be Mary and the sex should be male, so capital M. So what we want is baby names and we want the condition baby names uh, name equals Mary. And I think I didn't mention this before, but uh, it has to be case sensitive. So if you type Mary with small letters, it won't work. It has to match the case exactly. Uh, and we want baby names sex to be male. And it also needs to be a capital because it's capitals in the column sex here. And now we get 100 rows and they're all male and they're all Mary. So you can see there are a few uh, babies, male Marys. So the next one was find the names that are used by exactly five or six children in 1920. Um, let's just cut this and make this smaller so I can have it in the same screen. So baby names, square brackets, uh, find the names that were used by exactly five or six children. So baby names. Baby names count has to be five or baby names count has to be six. So let's see, this gives us all the babies that are either five or six babies. Uh, but we want to combine this because you want to have in the year 1920. So we put this whole thing in brackets and uh, the year equals 1920 and we should put that in brackets as well. So now we have the year 1920 with five or six babies and that's what we're looking for. I'll make this a bit shorter again so I can still see everything. So and then we have find the names that are either John, John, Johnny or Johnny. So that's again baby names. And then baby... Oops. Uh, let's see, how did that go? I should look up a bit <laughs> to see what it was again. Uh, is in. So this is what we're going to use. X is either A or B. So column is in and then the list of uh, values that we want. Uh, yeah, okay. So we want the name is in a list of John, another John, uh, a Johnny, and another Johnny. So yeah, we get John, 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 and other Johns. So now we have all the Johns uh, with is in. You can actually see there are a few uh, baby girls that were named John. And find the names that are either John. Yeah, so we did it. That's this one. So I'll make it a bit shorter again. So yeah, that's how these uh, selection filters work and you can combine them all together like that. So here's some common mistakes as well. Uh, if you're looking for a range, um, it might be uh, intuitive to write it like that. So 10 is smaller than what you're looking for is smaller than something else. Uh, but that doesn't work. You need to have separate uh, tests because if you do this, it will evaluate this part here, which is going to be true or false depending on N. And then it's trying to compare true is smaller than 20 and that doesn't mean anything. So then it will break down. So you have to split it up like this. 
and this is not really wrong wrong but it's not efficient so if you uh, if you can boil it down to a smaller number of tests uh, that would make your code much more readable so for instance in this test here where we were trying to see if the baby names is john john johnny or johnny uh, we could also have written it like we have here so df name equals john df name equals john df name equals johnny df etc and you can see it becomes very long if you do that so it's easier to write it like that using the isin operator it makes the code a lot shorter and shorter code is generally more readable so if you do write a report in the python notebook and you send it to somebody uh, they'll thank you for it <laughs> okay so now the next operation is uh, sorting and this is also an exercise on using the, the help so you can sort uh, based on the values and we're going to do that now but if you remember from chapter one uh, you have help which tells you uh, a lot about uh, functions so if you want to know about the function sort value you can type baby names sort values which is um, the sort function for uh, data frames and then it will tell you the, in the help exactly how to use it so this is sort values then you have a keyword by so what you should sort by which is listed here and it tells you name or list of names to sort by so if you say uh, baby name sort value uh, and then name it will sort by name and then you have these other um, other parameters axis ascending in place kind etc and they're all des uh, described here so the trick for this exercise oh actually it also has examples which is helpful so here we have a data frame that's being sorted by column one of this data frame here. So I want you to look, uh, do the help, and I want you to look at the help, and then use that in exercise 3.5 to find uh, the largest value of count. And that will give you the most popular baby name in the entire data set. And I also want you to find the smallest number of babies that is not zero. So you can combine it with uh, the, the selection rules to find the babies that are not zero, and then use sort values to find uh, the minimum number of babies. And it's not one, which is surprising, but I'll explain why. So I'll give you uh, well, seven minutes for this as well, so you can read the help page and find out uh, which options to use to find the largest value of count so the most popular baby names so that means uh well two o'clock on the dot oh and when you're done of course when the i'm done 3.5 function here okay so that was seven minutes um yeah so we can use sort values uh and the most logical thing to do is to sort by uh, count so if we have uh, baby names sort values uh, we want to sort um, by oop. so here's the help we want to sort uh, by something so by some sort of string and if we look in the examples, so they've created the data frame here uh, as an example. And if we want to sort, they say sort by uh, column one. So in our case, it would be sort by uh, count. So we can do that, sort by count. And you can see it sorts uh, from zero to uh, the maximum. So technically we're done right now because it's at the end, <laughs> uh, but really we want to uh, get like the top 10, maybe. Uh, we want to sort in the reverse order. So we want to change the order of uh, sorting. So we look at the options again and we see there's something called uh, ascending. So you can sort ascending versus descending. And the default value is true. So we can send ascending to false. And that's actually one of the examples that they have here. I also used a long notation 
So instead of the brackets, I just could have used count. Actually, I think you can just use counts without anything at all. Yeah, that works too. <laughs> so I can say ascending and uh, tab actually works for arguments as well. So I can just type ASC in the first three letters and if I press tab, it will autocomplete uh, ascending and I said false, I think. So now it changes it. Uh, and if I want to see the top 10, I can get the first 10. So these are the, pop 10, pop, the top 10 popular names for the last 100 year per year. So it's still Joseph and David that are way, way, way ahead of anybody else. So I'm sorry to say if your name is Joseph or David, you're very not unique. <laughs> At least, if you're born around that time. Uh, so the other one was uh, find the smallest value of count that is not zero. So we can do baby names again. Sort by values. Count again. Uh, ascending true, because we want to find the minimum this time. And you'll see we have uh, a lot of zeros. So we want to get rid of the zeros. So we can actually use a selection. So instead of the full data set, baby names, we can use baby names, baby names count is larger than zero, and then sort. Now we can see we can get five. So let's get the top five, well, top 10. So you can see that the minimum number of babies is five. Oh, uh, I actually just noticed I'm using uh, the single quotation and a double quotation interchangeably. Like in Python, you can use them, either one of them. There are some edge cases where it matters, but it won't matter for us. So you can use either one of them. Uh, yeah, so there are only five, actually. yeah. Um, there are only five because the data set is uh, called a bit for privacy reasons. Uh, because you don't want, uh, if there's only one baby born in Ontario, then you can pretty much identify them <laughs> because there's only one of them. So you already know who it is. And then you have some sort of uh, identif identifiable information, which you probably don't want to put out there in the open, even though in this case it's rather benign. Uh, they want to be careful with that stuff. So that's why it starts at five. So anytime a baby name occurs one, two, three, or four times, it's just thrown away from the data set and it's not published. So you can see that um, all these actions, they start to add up uh, and we can combine all of them as well. Uh, so for instance, if we want uh, the name and the number of baby boys from 2015 sorted by number, that's a whole range of operations, uh, but we can actually do that. So if we parse this statement here, uh, we want the name and number of baby boys names from 2015. So we want the baby names, uh, boy babies. So I can store that in an object. So I can call it boys 2015. And I want the baby names, baby names, oops, year equals 2015. And the sex has to be male. So this is already some, um, something we've done before. Oh, I should put this in brackets. Uh, let's make some extra rows there. So now I store this result in boys 2015. So let's see what that is. Boys 2015, so that's right. So what's next? We want to uh, sort it by number. So then we can take boys 2015, sort by values, Oh, sorry, that is wrong. <laughs> That's not how it works. It's pandas sort values. 
Um, wait, I'm confusing myself. It was right after all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we want to sort values and then by the column name count. And we wanted ascending again. False. And that result we want to store again. So we can type boys 2015 equals boys 2015 sorted by count and ascending false. So what this does is, I'll, I'll show you. So these are the boy babies 2015. Just, just get a bit more. And you can see it's sorted by count. So the way this works is first we have boys 2015 and it contains all the baby boys from 2015. Then we take that object, which contains all those uh, baby names, boy baby names from 2015. We sort that by count in non-ascending order, so descending order. And the result of that, we store into in boys 2015 again. So we take this value and then we, sorry, we take this object and we assign a new value to it that is sorted by count. So you can see that here, the baby name sorted by count. Uh, it also says we only want the name and number of baby boys, so we can do that as well. So if we want to get the names and the numbers, we can select the columns. So that's with the list, name, uh, not column, what did they say, number, count. Uh, so this is... Uh, here you select just the columns name and count, which is what something we've done before. And we can assign, assign that again to boys2015. So now you throw away the other columns and you only keep the name and count. So I'll execute that. And now boys2015.head contains just name, just count, and sorted by, uh, by count in, in descending order. Uh, yeah, so that's exactly what I had here. Actually, I reversed it. So you see here, I only took the columns name and count, and then I sorted. But it works either way. So now you can see in 2015, the most popular boy names were Liam, Benjamin, Noah, Lucas, Ethan, William, etc. Uh, yeah. You can also uh, stick this together. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. So what I mean with sticking together is you can take um, this part here that we had before. So that got you the male babies born in 2015, right? And then we can get the columns for this. So since this thing here, it's assigned to boy 2015, and here we use boys 2015 and we get the columns name and count. We could take this and put it at the end. So now we have Bill babies 2015. We only want the columns name and count. And then on that we can apply the sort values function. Oops, I forgot the ascending. Uh, ascending and then the top 10 so again after that you can put head 10 <laughs> and then we get the same thing as we got before but it's kind of a totally unreadable mess right now I mean it works but I would heavily prefer uh, doing it like that <laughs> uh, just for readability sake and also if you ever print out the report uh, it's going to cut off the text here, so you don't want that. Let's see if any questions. Yeah. Okay, so now it's your turn again. Uh, so I want you to find uh, the female babies born in 2007, and I want you to keep only the name and count column, and then find uh, the most popular name, so say the top 10. And the code is very similar to what I just demonstrated, so I'll give you five minutes for it. Uh, that's 
14, 17. And then it's probably time for a break. So um, you've got five minutes for this. OK, so uh, oops. OK, so let's see. We want to find the baby names uh, born in 2015. So we have baby names, and then we want the baby names, oops, the year is 2007, and the name, oh, sex. The sex is female with a capital. Let's see what that gets us. That gets us a female baby from 2007, so that's good. So let's call that girls 2007. And then we want only the name and count column, so that's like before. Girls 2007 is a name and count. And I want to plot that, or um, show you the output as well, so head 10. Yeah, so these are just the columns name and count, which is what I want, and I want to find the most popular names, so I need to sort as well. And sort, sort values, uh, sort by count in descending order, so ascending is false. And there you go. These are the most popular baby names for the year 2007. And yeah, Emma is the most popular name, which I think I saw Christian say in the chat. <laughs> oh, and Dominic. Yeah, and Olivia, uh, Ava, Emily is very popular. So, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so this lets you uh, look at the data pretty nicely. <laughs> you can also see that the indices are all over the place here. So they're totally unreliable now. <laughs> so then we get to the plotting. Technically the program said I should have been finished with chapter three already, but it's a lot to take in. So let's take a break for 15 minutes and we'll return at 3.05. So I'll see you in 50 minutes. I'll just put it here. Return at 3.05. Pick. Okay, see you in a bit. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, it did mean 2.35. <laughs> Moth is pretty hard. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, hello everybody. Uh, sorry about the miscalculation of the time there. I hope people will not come half an hour later than I said they would. <laughs> okay. So what we've done so far is um, we can select data and we can manipulate it, sort it and all that. Uh, but it would be nice to um, now plot the data. Uh, did I actually execute this code? I don't remember. Let's see, do I have female Marys already? No, I do not. Okay, let's go up a bit. Oh, I guess it's not in here. Hmm, okay, so I want uh, the female Marys. So that's baby names. Nope. Baby names, 
uh, name is Mary. Uh, and baby names sex is female. Oops, just one. Oops, keep pressing the wrong button there. There you go. Female Marys. What do I have? Yeah, okay. So now I have a data set uh, that contains uh, the female Marys. So what I did here quickly was um, I was under the impression that this was already loaded uh, in this uh, notebook, but it wasn't. So I guess I got that at some point and then forgot. Uh, anyway, uh, this is what you've done before. So baby names is a certain name and sex is a certain sex. So that gets you the filtered data set that contains only the female Marys. And it works really well together with um, uh, Seaborn. So with SNS, uh, I can call the line plot. So line plot is not one we've used. Well, we've used it in passing in the previous chapter, in chapter two, for visualization. Uh, line plot takes all the points and draws a line for it. So I'm going to plot year versus count for the female Marys. And then you get this. So this is the popularity of the name Mary. So in 1920, there weren't all that many. That might also be a result of data collection. It's always a bit murky in the beginning, like this is more than 100 years ago. So <laughs> anyway, there were a lot of names. It peaked in 1945 and then it fell off dramatically. So I'm not sure what happened there, but for some reason, Mary was not a popular name after all. And now almost nobody used it. Um, like before, um, you can combine it. So we have assigned baby names to female Marys and then we use data female Marys. Uh, but you can also combine it in one go. So then it looks like this. We do line plot year count and then data is baby names, but baby names with all those selections. So that's not very... Um, <laughs> It's not very readable. It's easier to just uh, create a data set first and then use the plot function on that data set. So let's also get the ones for the baby's name Marie. So it's the French version. Now we have that in female Marie. And uh, let's make a new cell so we can see what's in it. Female Marie. So that's Marie. And if you want to plot them both at the same time, uh, I've mentioned this in the previous chapter, if you type both plots in the same cell, it will plot, um, plot it in the same plot. So now we get uh, Mary and Mary. And you can see that uh, it's actually pretty similar, which is interesting, <laughs> I think. So the popularity of the Marie and Mary is almost the same. Like Marie was uh, popular for a little longer. Um, the trouble with uh, plotting it like this is if that if you use something like uh, rel plot, which gave you the facet grid plots, uh, it doesn't work like this. So if you want to plot them on top of each other, uh, you have to use uh, line plot or scatter plot, but you cannot use rel plot. So any plot that as output has something called a facet grid, and uh, that's not going to work. And for that, you need to modify your data set uh, to have the data that you want. So here we have two data sets, female Marie's and sorry, female Marie's and female Marie's. Um, you need to combine that so that each column is for a different name. And that's what I said here. So now it's time for like a mini exam. Uh, so I want you to combine everything you've learned so far. So first uh, trim the baby, name, baby names to just the rows that contain your name and your sex. 
uh, if your name was not in the, the data set, then, um, oh, I see somebody, yeah, the connection failed. Uh, yeah, if you don't touch it uh, for long, uh, for a while, then it will time out, and then you need to go to uh, ccg.ca again and log in again. Uh, sorry, yeah, so the mini exam. Uh, so I want you to trim the baby names to just rows that contain your name and sex. And yeah, if your name was not in a data set like mine is not, then just choose something else. Uh, then I want you to trim that result to just have the names and the columns that will, sorry, just the columns that will appear in your graph. Um, it's not really required, but uh, it's good practice. Like it doesn't give you an overdose of data. And then I want you to plot the results as a line graph with a year on the x-axis and prop on the y-axis. So it's like this plot, but for count instead of for a year. So this should combine all the knowledge that we've uh, discussed so far. And I will give you um, 10 minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes for that. So 1452. And my mouth is actually correct this time. Oh, and when you're done, you should run, I'm done, three comma seven again, of course. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Um, so we want to trim the baby names to just the rows that contain your name and sex. So uh, my name is not in the database, so I'll just use Emily. Um, Something like that, doesn't matter. Baby names. Uh, I just want the rows that contain my names and my sex. So baby names, Emily. So oh. ah. should be name equals Emily. And baby names. Sex equals female. Uh, and print the results so I can see what I have. So, yeah, that's the female, um, well, your name, in my case it's Emily. Uh, trim the result to just the columns that will appear on your graph. So, I will take. Oops. Uh, I want on my plot, I want to plot the year and I want to plot prop. So that's all I need. Let's see what this shows me. So now I just have the columns year and prop, which is exactly what I need for the graph. So then I can get rid of that and make the plot. So SNS dot line plot uh, year and prop for the data Emily name. Ta -da. <laughs> so this is the plot for the name Emily. You can see it became really popular around 1990, 1995, peaked around 2000, and then it went down again. I saw some people wondering about Emma instead, because that was the popular name in 2017, one of the exercises, so we can look at that as well. You can see that went steadily up until 2000, 2004, 2007. Oh, Matthew is not hearing audio. I am unmuted. Okay. Hmm. I guess it's a problem for Matthew. <laughs> Oh well. Um, yeah, so this is the code that you need for this little exam. And you can plot how popular your name is or anybody name, anybody's name. So here's a quiz for you. Uh, do we have enough information to calculate the total number of children with each name? So, so far we've been doing uh, one name and plotting it. But can we combine it all? Can, can we get a total number of children with each name? Like, do we have that information? Uh, can we extract that information from our data set? 
and you can type in the chat if you think you can or if you cannot or if it's possible put it like that <laughs> so yeah most people are answering yes and that's probably also why i have this quiz in here <laughs> So there's a lot of statistical functions that we can use in uh, Pandas. So Pandas does not only let you select data and all that sort of stuff, it will let you uh, calculate things as well. So if we look at the, the count column in uh, baby names and we take the sum of that, then we get, uh, what is that? 10,349,108. So that's the total number of babies um, born in the last 100 years in Ontario. Uh, well, not completely because we threw away all the names that had uh, less than five uh, births, but this should be a pretty close. Uh, pretty close. Uh, we can also look at the maximum with max, so 3946. And if you remember from a while back when we looked at the most popular name. I think it was either Joseph or David, I think Joseph, that had uh, this number in count. There's also a function called nUnique, and it, con it counts the number of unique entries. So if you look at the names column in our baby names, uh, then it will show you um, how many different names are in the entire dataset. So let's do that. So we can see there are, there are 8,087 unique names in Ontario. It's not a whole lot actually, <laughs> considering at how many people there are in uh, Ontario. Uh, yeah, it also works uh, if you don't specify the column name, uh, but then it will do it for all the columns. So it will still get you the information. Uh, I mean, Count is not very interesting because it just counts the number of rows. I use count here because it's the fastest function. And you can see they're all the same because there are 856,000 rows in the dataset. So generally you want to specify the column and then do the statistical function instead of the other way around. So, um, yeah, what about the totals for each name? Uh, that is in our next section here, grouping. So I'll come to that. And sorry, what is n unique for? Uh, n unique is the number of unique entries. So it looks at all the names in the data set. So if you look at the baby names, there's a lot of uh, names that occur multiple times because it's one entry per year and also per sex. So lots of names occur lots of times and they occur in different years as well. So if you use n unique, you get really the number of unique names uh, in the data set. So it's time for our next exercise. Uh, I want you to find uh, the rows where the name is Khaleesi. And then I want you to use the function sum and minimum to find uh, the total number of children named Khaleesi for the past 100 years. And I also want you to find the first year of Khaleesi, uh, the first occurrence of Khaleesi in the data. Uh, this one is a bit tricky because you have to use uh, the min function, but you have to account for the fact that zero also is in there. And we want to get, oh, sorry, this could call that. Uh, never mind, you can use the function min. Uh, you won't have any trouble with a zero because we're looking for the year and there's no year zero, so that's fine. I was confused with count there. So yeah, I want you to find the total number of children named Khaleesi. You can use sum for that. And I want you to find uh, the first year the name Khaleesi appeared in the data using min. And I'll give you uh, four minutes for that. So we'll continue at 15.03. Okay, so let's see. Uh, we want to extract all the rooms where the names is Khaleesi. So we know how to do that baby names, baby names, name equals Khaleesi, let's see what we get. So those are the baby names uh, Khaleesi, uh, baby 
Kind of no, I'll just call it C. So, uh, we want to find the sum. So the total number of babies. Sorry, we want to find the total number of children. So that's the sum of all occurrences of the babies. So we take uh, the column count, which contains the number of children. Uh, actually, I should show you. So those are all the children. And then we take the sum of that. Get 41. So there were 41 children uh, named Khaleesi in the past 100 years. And we can use the same Khaleesi. And we want the, the first year Khaleesi appeared, so we are interested in the year. Oh, uh, wait, we are not interested in the year. We want the first occurrence of uh, name babies, so we need to have a count that is larger than zero. So this is a count larger than zero, and we want to know the year, and we want to know the first time it occurred, so we want the minimum. So 2012. So the first uh, baby was named uh, Khaleesi in 2012, which happens to be the start of the second season of Game of Thrones. So the first this is probably done based on the first season of Game of Thrones because nine months later uh, there was a baby and people started naming their kids uh, Khaleesi uh, after the show, <laughs> which is kind of neat. So, <clears throat> um, now we want to extend that. So we now know the total name number, we now know how to get the total number of children for a specific name, but we want to know that for all the children. And we can do that by using grouping. So first I'm going to use a, a small data set instead of the huge baby names. And I'll show you how to do it. And then I'll get you to do it with uh, the actual baby names. So here I generate a data frame. It has a column city, a column size, a column amount. And it's supposed to be like a pollution database. So I have three cities, New York, London and Beijing. I have large, pollut large pollutants and small pollutants, so these are the particles that float around in the air. And then this is uh, the concentration, probably in parts per million or something like that. So I will execute that. And then when I look at it, it's in the data frame format. So we have New York, New York, London, London, Beijing, Beijing, and large, small particles, and then uh, the amount of pollution. So we can get stats for the full data set, uh, like we had before. So if we look at amount, uh, pollution amount, and you'll notice I'm using double brackets here because that gets me the data frame. And then when I do a mean, I will get the mean for that data frame, uh, that is 42. And I can do look at the, the sum, and I can look at the number of occurrences. So the average uh, pollution for all these cities for both large and small particles is 42. Uh, the sum of all this is 252, and there are six entries uh, that correspond to it. So that is not very interesting. <laughs> uh, so we want to know the stats per city. like, And for that, we can use uh, something called uh, group by. So group by lets you group uh, your data frame by, uh, by city or by size or even by amount. And it will look for uh, entries that have the same value in that column and it will group them together. So to see what I mean by that. So if I have a new object called group by city, I take my pollution data set and I group by city. And oh, I guess I already had it there. <laughs> so now I've grouped uh, by city. 
and to see what groups are in it, you can use group by city dot groups. So this is again a property, so there are no brackets here. And you can see we have a group called Beijing, a group called London, and a group called New York. And Beijing has indices 4 and 5. So if we go back up, 4 and 5, those correspond to Beijing. Then we have another group, London, it's indices 2 and 3, and New York is indices 0 and 1. So now we have uh, separated our database data frame, uh, and now we have separate groups uh, from them. So now if I take group by city and I look at the column amount, so let's just put that there, amount, um, uh, it won't tell you anything because this is no longer a data frame, it's uh, a group but you can still use the statistical functions on it. So if I take the mean, now I get the mean per city. So Beijing has 88.5. And if we look at what pollution had, uh, Beijing had large and small, and it's grouped. So Beijing is grouped. So it's looking at average of 121 and 56. So 121 plus 56 divided by 2 is 88.5. So that's exactly right. And you can do the sum as well. Then you get the sum per city and count. And you can see you have two entries per city. So two entries is a large, small, uh, oh sorry, small and large. It's for each city. And you also notice uh, if I look at pollution here in this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, that's gone now too. Now city is our index. And city, Beijing, London, and New York, it's no longer numbers. Uh, you can also do it by multiple columns. So you can group by city and size. So you can do that. And then if you look at the groups, you see you have Beijing large, Beijing small, London large, London small. So every row is now basically its own uh, group because there's only one entry for those combinations and then when you look at the mean or the sum uh, you can see it's the original data again but city and size are now indices and there's only one column here which is amount and you can see that when you look at count there's only one item for every group So if we want to apply that to the baby names, uh, we can, for instance, uh, look at uh, the total number of babies uh, per sex. So you can use group by sex. Uh, let's do that. Baby names, sex count. Baby names, group by Six. And then when we look at baby names, oh, it's a data frame group object, so we want to look at the groups for this. So then we have two groups, uh, female and male. And these are all the indices of the rows that have female babies. And these are all the rows that have indices for male babies. Uh, let's see, can I convert a group object into a data frame? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, we'll come back to that later, because at some point you want to go plot these things and then we need to uh, go back. Uh, can you please uh, can explain why we do have double closed brackets? Yeah, so the double closed brackets, um, it changes it. Uh, sorry, how do I say that? So with the single brackets, you get uh, a Python list. With the double brackets, you get a data frame back. And you want to stay with data frames because data frames have more functions available. They also have prettier markups. Uh, if I make this uh, single, then I get it like this. Uh, it's now a Python object that doesn't have very nice formatting. So if you just use the double brackets, we stay into the data frames. And then it's like a data frame that's much better to look at. 
Uh, yeah, exactly, Professor. Um, yeah, so in our baby names, sex count, we have group by sex, and we can see the groups. And now we want to um, concentrate on the, uh, the column. We want to concentrate on the column count because we want to count the total number of babies. So if I look at count for that group, oh, it's uh, that's a group by, so it doesn't show you anything. Uh, but you want to see uh, the sum for each group. There you go. So because we had group by sex, and then we run sum on the column count, you could get the total number of female babies and the total number of male babies. So there were 4.9 million female babies and 5.4 million uh, male babies. So there's a slight imbalance towards male babies there. And now it's your turn again. So this was a whole lot. So I put in like uh, the skeleton here and I only want you to fill in the, the triple dots here every time. So what I want you to find is the 10 most popular name and sex combinations. So I want you to uh, group by uh, name and sex like we did before for city and um, city and size. And then compute the popularity as the total number of children with a given name and sex. So what I want to see in the end is uh, a top 10 of uh, baby name plus sex combinations. So if like David, uh, sorry, Joseph male is the most popular, I should see that at top uh, with the total number for the entire 100 years. And the skeleton is already here. You have to fill in the dots to get what you want. And I'll give you uh, five minutes for that. So 320. Okay, so that was about five minutes. Yeah, this was a rather complicated e exercise because there are so many lines here. <laughs> so let's just go through it. Um, we want to know the, the baby names. Names, popularity. So we first want to group by uh, by names because we... By so we want to group by name and sex because we want to find uh, the most popular uh, name and sex combinations. So baby names group by and we want name and sex. Let's add some more lines there. So what does baby names contain now? Oh. Groups. I should not have done that. <laughs> oh, that's not that bad. Okay. So it's showing me all the baby names uh, by group. So Adam male, uh, Aiden male, Aja female. They all have a different group and they all have the indices. And there were about 8,000 of this, so that took a while. Probably maybe even more. I forget what it was. Um, so I was a bit worried that it wouldn't return quickly. <laughs> So anyway, that's in our group now. Uh, we want to look at the popularity. So uh, we want um, the total number of children. And it's already grouped by name and sex. So we need uh, the count column. Uh, baby names, popularity, count. And then we want the total sum for that. So baby names, popularity, uh, baby names, um, popularity, sum. So we group by name and sex. So that's in uh, baby's popularity. And then we take the column count and we store that in baby's popularity. And then we take the sum. So now we have to sum of the count column for each name sex combination. So let's see what that gets us. Yeah, that looks good. So we had 8,060 uh, rows. Uh, for all the name sex combinations, we get uh, the total count. 
but we're not quite there yet because we need to sort it because we want to uh, get a top 10 of names so baby names popularity baby names popularity and we want to sort and that's our sort values function again that we had before and we want to sort by counts that's really the only com column with that we have and we want the most popular so we also need to add uh, ascending false execute and then we have it sorted now by count so the total number of babies with a specific name uh, but we wanted uh, the top 10 uh, get the first 10 so baby names popularity popularity and the top 10 and then the output so there we go these are the top 10 for the last century of uh, baby names so joseph john robert michael david william james are the most popular names and then we have marie and mary and it's interesting that the top uh, seven is all males so it kind of sounds like there was not a lot of variation with male names and there's a lot of more variation with uh, uh, female names because they're more spread out apparently and now we want to uh, put these results in a plot because like a table is nice but it's hard to compare these numbers uh, but to do that we need to go back from this which has an index name and sex so this is now the index name sex and it has the column count so there's only one column uh, but if you want to plot, we have to convert this back into uh, a regular data frame again that has the column name, sex, and count instead of the index name, sex, and the column count. So to do that, we have to use a reset index. So that's what I have here. I have baby names popularity becomes baby names popularity reset index. And then I output it right away so we can see what it is. And now we can see that name and sex are regular columns again, and we have an automatically generated index as well. So now we have a regular data frame with 10 entries. That is the name, sex, and count as columns. You can see the difference. Name, sex is like slightly lower than count. That indicates that name, sex is the index. Also, these entries are bold, which also indicates that they're indexes, indices. And here that's all gone because we did reset index so then we can plot it and i will use uh, the bar plot um, the bar plot takes uh, columns and plots them as bars so let's just put that here um, uh, sns so bar plot and we plot the name versus count and our input data is uh, the baby names popularity after the reset index so that's what we stored here baby names popularity and there you go it has uh, the plot uh, right here uh, but they're all different colors so that's not very pretty so we can say color equals blue and now they're all the same color it's actually a horrible color. What did I choose before? Light blue. Light blue is probably a lot better. There we go. That's not too bad. <laughs> and then we have the letters that are overlapping again. So if you remember from the previous chapter, we could change the uh, we could change the font size. So we have to assign it to uh, an object. Uh, I keep using P, but you can use whatever you want. And then we had p uh, dot set. Uh, what was it? X labels. P dot get x labels. And we specify the size uh, eight, I guess. Oh, did I do it wrong? Right, tick labels. Sorry tick labels there we go and now the font is smaller here 
uh, we still get this weird output here and that's because it outputs whatever is lost in here so to get rid of that we can use pass as before and now I have a nice bar chart that shows the names as a function of uh, sorry that shows you the names and how popular they were in the last century so now it's your turn again um, so I want you to calculate the total number of children born for every year so before we had uh, the sex name combinations but now I want you to uh, find the answer to what was the quiz uh, when we started this uh, after the break sorry when we started this just after the previous break and I want you to use group by so group by year and then get the total number of children born for every year and then if you have that you can plot the results as a line graph so total versus year and this one is a bit more complicated because I didn't put in the scaffolding that we had before but the idea is to use a group by group by year and then get uh, the sum for every year and I'll give you uh, seven minutes for that so that's 1536 and as you can see it gets more complicated as we go further into this so yes uh, looks like at least one person had uh, connection failed again uh, other persons having this as well Okay, it's okay for other people. Okay, well, let's see what happens there. <laughs> anyway, um, we want to calculate the total number of children born for every year, which is the, the question of the quiz that we had in the beginning here. Um, do we have enough information to calculate the total number of children uh, with each name? So that's what we are after now and we can do that by group by so total children is baby names group by year and then we want uh, the total number of children born from each year so now we have group by year and we want the totals for each group so we want the sum children um, sorry we want the column count there we go total children and we want the column count and then from that we want the sum there you go <laughs> so now for each year you can see uh, the total number of children so what we did here is we grouped by year then we took the column count and then we took the sum of that so for each group we have um, for each group we have the total number of children for that year so I'll just store this in total children again because we're not quite done yet we still want to plot it so now total children contains uh, the total number of children per year but we can't, can't plot that yet because we need to do reset index to change it from uh, to change it from this to total children reset index Oh, and I should assign that to total children. So I reset the index now. And now total children is a normal data frame again, which we can plot. And I said I wanted to line plot, I think. Yeah, plot as a line graph, uh, the total versus year. So here we have year, uh, here we have year, and here we have count so sns.line plots 
uh, year versus count and our data is total children and there we go we can see uh, the total number of children uh, per year and you can probably guess what this is uh, that's the baby boomers just uh, after the second world war so a huge amount of babies and then down again and then there's another spike here so I'm not entirely sure what happened there what caused so many babies I think somebody knew the last time I gave this workshop but I forget now what it was anyway <laughs> uh, so now you get the total number of babies uh, per year so yes we could indeed uh, do the question answer that question and get the total number so then we're almost done with this chapter uh, we were supposed to be doing chapter 4 oh, uh, Jarno can you scroll back to show index function uh, you mean the reset index? yeah okay yeah so we needed to do uh, the reset index to change it from this format where the year is the index to this format where the year is just a regular column and reset index does that for us So there's just a few more things left. Uh, we can also mutate data, which is uh, really convenient. So if you look at baby names, we have the columns year, sex, name, count, and prop. Uh, but we can add more columns if we want. So we can say baby names. And if you want to calculate a percentage from the proportionality, so proportionality is the number of babies divided by the total number of babies. So that's a fraction. But if you want a percentage, we need to multiply that. And we can make up any column that we want. So I can say percentage. And that's since that column does not exist, it's going to be a new column. And uh, percentage is times 100 of baby names. Prop. And I just did that. And now if we look at baby names, I'll just print the first five. Uh, you can see there's a new column percentage, uh, which is 100 times the prop. Uh, total children is total children that reset index. Is there a typo? Uh, no, that's right. I think you can only do it once. I'm not sure what happens if you do a reset index on something that you already did reset index. Probably nothing. This one gives me an error. Hmm. Um, I'll let one of the helpers help you with that. Uh, yes, okay, so that's the number of babies um, it's you can't really see anything right now because uh, prop is zero so if you want to see something we can do a quick selection where oops, where count is larger than zero and now you can see we have a proportion proportion 0 0.000216 and percentage is exactly 100 times that so we've got our new column now with that information and yeah you can use uh, the function as well so here i have a function and percentage which is a rounded percentage so i use the function from numpy round and i can take the new column that i just created and store the results in another column uh, this is a bit of a silly example because at no point i think the percentage goes above six percent but let's see what this shows oh it does okay so there are a few uh, baby names where the proportionality is uh, 0 0.7 percent and when you round that you get to one so now we have percentage and a rounded percentage so in 2001 abigail was almost one percent of the babies I think I said before that the name Joseph had 6% of the baby names, but in retrospect that was 0.6%. So that was wrong. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> so now we have our new data set that's based on data from our old uh, data. And we want to save that at some point, of course. Uh, so one way to do that is with the function uh, to CSV. So it takes the data that's currently loaded in Jupyter and it saves it into a CSV file with whatever you want to call it. And then you can send that data to other people or upload it to your website. And they can read it in again with read CSV. Or they can read it in, in other programs, not Python based at all, because CSV is kind of a, a standard format. And yeah, and that's the end of chapter three. Uh, so how to um, manipulate data, select data, and that sort of thing. And that leaves us with 14 minutes until the end of the workshop, which isn't a whole lot of time, especially since I had uh, another chapter, chapter four. But I'll go through whatever I can, uh, just to give you a taste on uh, programming your own functions for manipulating the data. So if you go back to the file manager where you have all your uh, notebooks, uh, you can open chapter four in there. Uh, will I be posting the answers to the coding exercises? Uh, yeah, I will send you a link to uh, the repository where all the answers are included uh, in, the in the notebooks themselves. So if you missed some solutions today, uh, don't worry, I'll send it out. Okay, chapter four. And I will zoom. Oh, connection failed. And that means I need to log in again. <laughs> it does that if you use it for too long. It's kind of too bad, but that's the way it is. Chapter 4. Okay, it works now. So now we don't load any libraries except for the one that has the exercises. And this is uh, completely without banners and without plotting. Uh, this is just uh, bare Python without using any, uh, any libraries uh, whatsoever. And I'm going to introduce you to uh, for loops and if, and which are control statements that let you uh, go through the programs. So one thing that happens often is if you have to repeat actions. So if you have to do something for uh, multiple files, for instance. So here we always used one data set, Ontario baby names. But suppose you're doing measurements and you have a whole bunch of data files uh, data 1, data 2, data 3, data 4, etc. Uh, you want to um, uh, want to automate that, like you don't want to copy-paste that code for every data file and do it by, by hand. Uh, so we start with an, a simple example. So I have one word, and the word is let, and I want to print all the letters. So word equals Let's. And you can get the individual uh, letters from each word by using the array index uh, zero, so that gets you the first one, two, uh, etc. Uh, but we'll be using the print function, which does essentially the same thing except it prints out without any uh, markup from Python, so it just prints out the letter A. So if you want to print out the four letters of the word let, you would have print word zero, print word one, print word two, print word three. And indeed, if you execute that, you get let with one letter on each line. Uh, but it doesn't work very well because if you change the word, so if you change this to a shorter word like tin, you get an error because it's trying to print the, the fourth character of the word tin. And there is no fourth character, and indeed that's what it says, uh, string index out of range. Uh, so instead we can use uh, a for loop. So let's put it there. So for, 
You can already see it, it turns green because Python recognizes it as a, a word that you want to use. And the way it works is you type letter in uh, some collection. So here at the top, I defined the word being let. So for letter in word, that means for every letter in whatever is in word, so word contains the let, uh, letter will take that value. And then you have to type a column and then enter. And you notice it starts over here instead of at the beginning. So your cursor is four spaces in. And that's called uh, the indentation. And it's very, very, very important in Python. Uh, if you uh, don't have the right indentation, you'll get all sorts of errors. And now we can print a letter like that. And now it stops. You don't get an error because, uh, oh, actually, sort word is thin. So if I change it to something else, word is... I don't know, calcium or something. Then it will do it for each letter in the word. And this letter here, uh, it's another variable. So you can change it to whatever you want. Like you can call it ABC, but then here you also need to use ABC. It's just a, a variable name. So that's how uh, for loops work. Uh, oh, I just did that for calcium, oxygen. <laughs> It works the same way. So it works the same way. So that is how the for loop works. So you have for some variable, some collection, and the collection can be a string. So then it takes all the letters, but it can also be a list, and it takes all the items of the list. And there are lots of other kinds of collections like that. And then you do things uh, using that variable. So in this example, we use print, but you can also use other functions on that. Uh, let's see, I have eight minutes left. Um, I'll just scroll ahead to see if there's anything that's particularly <laughs> important since we're not going to get to the end of this. Uh, yeah, we're not going to make that. So I'm going to um, skip a bit. I'm going to skip the quizzes and I'm going to straight to explain the syntax and then later um, when you are working on uh, when I post all the solutions you can uh, look at this and uh, try it out yourself but at least I will have explained it a bit. Uh, here's another for loop which uses a range. So range goes from some number to some other number and that lets you loop over numbers. So this will go over 2, 2, 6, and uh, not included. Or you can just put in one number, then it goes from 0 to 4, uh, 4 not included. And, and that allows you to uh, go from one numeric value to another, and which is something that occurs uh, very often in programming. Uh, I don't have a good example for it right now, <laughs> but it will it was supposed to enter into this exercise that we'll skip right now. <laughs> and then we have conditional actions. So sometimes you want something to happen when something is true. So the structure for that is if some condition do something, else if some other condition do something else, or else if none of that is true, then do some other cases. And you can repeat this center thing as often as you like. Uh, is there code to break infinite loops? Yeah, you can use the, the keyword break and that will break the loop. So if in my example here, I print the range, range from two to six. So that's two, three, four, five, six. But if I put in break, it will break the loop after the first print. So it will only print two. Um, yeah, so if statements kind of look like this as a flowchart. You go into your program and if, uh, sorry, I skipped something there. So if I take num is 25, I compare it, num larger than 20, then I print this, else I print this, I print this. So it can be captured in this flowchart here. So if number is larger than, uh, well, 100 in this picture, if it's true, it prints this, if it's false, it prints that. So if goes to there, 
else goes to there. And then when this is done, it goes back into uh, the main program, so to say. The, it converts it back together and then it uh, goes back to uh, executing wherever it left off. And you'll notice there's no spaces in front of this. So that means that this is not part of the is el if else. If I were to do it like this, then it's part of the else statement. So if num is, uh, let's, let's see, if num is larger than 20, it prints this, else it prints that. But now it prints num is not larger than 20, print done. So in this case, num is larger than 20. So it does this, but then it never gets to print done because this is now part of the else loop. So if you want to return, oops, it has to be like this. So that's what I mean when I uh, say uh, indentation is very important. And we can have multiple competitions with the end. So if you remember chapter two, three, chapter three, we had the conditional for Python as well. Uh, there were the keywords and, or, and not, and you can combine them. So here, if num is larger than 10 and num is larger than 40, it says number lines between 10 and 40. And you can use not to infer it, I think. So num is larger than 10, which is true because num is 25. But then you have a not, which makes it false. And then this never happens. So I can execute this and it only prints this one because num is between 10 and 40 and it's not larger than 10. And then we have a quiz. Um, yeah, I'm running out of time. So here's how you define function. And again, the indentation is very important. So now you can write your own functions uh, to execute things. I have an example of a factorial function. And that was an ex exercise. And then I wanted you to build uh, a guessing game, <laughs> which was exercise 4.4. And then when you've defined a function, you can use that function with aggregate. So aggregate applies that function to every column A or column B inside of your uh, data frame. So if you've written your own function, you can use that to uh, mutate your data uh, with a very complex function. So in chapter three, we mutated by saying 100 times that or a round of that. But here you can define your own functions instead of using uh, the standard functions. And then there's also standalone scripts. Uh, so now we've been using the Jupyter Notebook to run Python, but you can also download Python on your own computer, uh, which is especially helpful if you have a lot of, lot of data. And also if you don't want to share your data on some sort of public platform. I, I mean, your data is private on CCG, uh, but technically the CCG people could be able to see it which could get you in trouble with like ethics and stuff like that. And then where to go from here, I have a few more resources like LinkedIn Learning, uh, everybody with uh, UO access credentials, and also the one person from Toronto, I think that's around here, uh, can go to LinkedIn Learning and have free access uh, with their university credentials. Uh, so that's true for all the uh, educational institutes in Ontario. There's also the main Python website, which has lots of tutorials available. And there's one thing, and uh, it's a bit of a warning. So there's Python 2 and there's Python 3, and the syntax is different. So programs that are written for Python 2, they may not work with Python 3 and vice versa. So when you look up tutorials, make sure it's for Python 3 and not for Python 2, because Python 2 is no longer supported. It's uh, out of support and, and nobody uses it anymore unless they have to. <laughs> to have some, to work on some legacy code. Uh, you can also install Jupyter on your own computer. And if you want to run scripts that are too heavy for your own computer, you can use Compute Canada to get access to tens of thousands of CPUs and uh, hundreds of gigabytes of RAM. You can even get GPUs and all that. And I put in a link on how to get started with that. And with that, we're at four o'clock. So that was chapter four in really rapid, <laughs> uh, really rapid. And then I would like to end the workshop now because we're at time. I'll send you all the, the slides and I'll send you all the solutions. And the video will be recorded. Uh, the video was recorded and it will be posted in probably a week or so. 
maybe a bit later because as you know the universe of Otto gave us the second and third of July off so free vacation <laughs> Uh, yeah, so thank you all for joining uh, this seminar, uh, this workshop. I hope it was useful for you. And sorry about the technical difficulties, but I'm very happy with the CCG team that fixed all of this in like 40 minutes, which is amazing. Okay, thank you everybody. <laughs> and good luck with uh, learning Python. <laughs>